Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the UK Boarding School Eye Festival. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Wallace Wong, and I am the Registrar of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. I will also serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Today's agenda will include presentations from some of the best girls boarding schools in the UK. Each presentation will last approximately 30 minutes. And in each presentation, we will also include a Q&A session, which will last approximately 10 minutes. Now for the Q&A session, please type in your questions in the Q&A box that you can find on your screen. You can press this box at the bottom of your screen, which will prompt up a box to your right, allowing you to type in your questions. I, the moderator, will then ask your questions aloud to our speakers to answer. We'll do our best to address all questions asked during today's Q&A. Now, at the end of each presentation, contact details of each school or organization will be provided on your screen. We'll also follow up with a post-webinar survey to all our viewers. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to the speaker for today, Headmaster of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong, Mr. Howard Tuckett. Howard. And uh, can I add my welcome to Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong's uh, British Boarding Schools Festival. You're all very welcome, and we hope that you find the afternoon to be useful. Uh, this is the second of three Saturdays that we're fortunate enough to be hearing from over 16 different speakers. Uh, we heard from the co-ed schools last week, uh, Marlborough, Seven Oaks, Rugby, and Caterham School. And today we're celebrating the girls' schools, and we'll be hearing uh, speakers from Down House, from Wickham Abbey, um, BE, uh, BE Education, join us, uh, Cheltenham Ladies College, St. Mary's Khan, and Badminton. And these speakers will all either be head teachers or senior members of staff. Our webinar today is uh, hosted by us here, Wickham Abbey in Hong Kong, and I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce you to our team who will be uh, looking after you this afternoon. I'm Howard Tuckett, I'm the headmaster at Wickham Abbey. Uh, you've already met uh, Wallace Wong, our registrar, and we're joined this afternoon by Ben Mitchell, who's one of our year five teachers, and Emily Harrison, who's year one, one of our year one teachers, and also works, actually both Ben and Emily, work with our young primary school children who are preparing to enter British boarding schools. Uh, ben as uh, one of the teachers of the older years, and Emily uh, works with children, helping them to prepare uh, for boarding uh, mentally and practically and uh, the whole adventure of, uh, of the big move. A very special vote of thanks this afternoon to Ruth Benny and Top Schools for so kindly hosting today's uh, webinar for us. Thank you very much, Ruth and the team at Top Schools. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Patrick Sherrington. And Patrick is the chair of Wickham Abbey International Limited, and he will be making a welcoming address for us. In Britain, and I'm proud of my continuing association with Wickham now as chair of Wickham Abbey International Limited, which is responsible for its international operations. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Wickham Abbey Festival of Boarding Schools, the first event of its kind. We're delighted that so many prestigious British boarding schools have been able to join us over three consecutive Saturdays for this event. Each of the presenters are key members of staff at their respective schools, and each speaker will be presenting on an important aspect of modern British education. This event is aimed at Hong Kong parents, and I know from having lived in Hong Kong myself for nearly 15 years, how important education is to Hong Kong parents. Everything you see and hear is designed to inform you of the breadth and excellence of British boarding provision. And each speaker's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. And I would encourage you to ask as many questions as you like. Here in Hong Kong, Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is a private British prep school. And as such, the headmaster, Howard Tuckett and his team are experts at preparing young children for their secondary schools. 
So please feel free to contact Howard and the team at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong for information about boarding schools in Britain at any time. And finally, may I thank again all of those schools for their participation in this event and all of you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick Sherrington, for that welcome message. Uh, and as we're uh, moving on to our first speaker of the day, uh, our very own Mr. Howard Tuckett, headmaster of Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. Now, Howard trained as a teacher in Natal, South Africa. He has taught in independent schools in South Africa, Botswana, England, and now Hong Kong. Over the last 20 years, Howard has been a preparatory school headmaster at St. Joseph's School in Suffolk in Caterham School in Surrey, and is currently the founding headmaster of Wickham Abbey School of Hong Kong. Howard is married with two children. Without further ado, Howard, I'll pass over the mic to you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you very much. Um, are you seeing my slides all right there, Wallace? No, uh, we're still on the video screen. Okay, so let me start that again. There we go. Yes. All right, good. Thank you very much. Getting over all the technology. Good afternoon again, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for your attendance. Um, I'm very pleased to be the first speaker. And I'm very conscious of the, uh, the, the number of schools that will be following me. Um, it might be very useful for parents in Hong Kong to know that there is a British prep school in Hong Kong for Hong Kongers, which uses exactly the same curriculum uh, as all other British prep schools. Uh, so that children that are at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong, uh, which is a co-ed primary, a private prep school, um, for boys and girls, the children that are at this school are following exactly the same curriculum as children are in British preparatory schools who are preparing to enter the great schools, some of which you'll be hearing from uh, later on. Of course, we are based uh, from our own Wickham Abbey, uh, who are in the town of High Wickham, uh, not about halfway between London and Oxford. If you take a straight line from London uh, up to the, the northwest, uh, towards Oxford, about halfway you'll found, find the town of High Wickham, and there you'll find Wickham Abbey uh, just outside the centre of the town. A beautiful site, many, many fields, big boarding houses, and this is a shot of the main, uh, uh, the main core building, but there are many other buildings around it that you can't see uh, in this picture. Wickham Abbey, famously a very academic girls' school. Uh, it's almost entirely 100% boarding. It is only a girls' school. Um, and, and has outstanding results. Um, and you can see on the slide here, uh, some of the locations of the, the great universities that the girls from Wickham Abbey uh, move off to afterwards. Wickham Abbey is a selective school. Um, our girls from Wickham Abbey in Hong Kong do not get an automatic place at Wickham Abbey in the United Kingdom, although they can transfer to the other Wickham Abbeys uh, in China, in Changzhou, Hangzhou, and Nanjing but they uh, will need to apply and pass into Wickham Abbey UK uh, on a competitive basis. As I say, the benefit of being with us though is that they are following the correct curriculum uh, to prepare for, for entry to Wickham Abbey or indeed any of the other great British independent schools. So this is a picture of our Wickham Abbey. Uh, this is our front um, uh, from our front uh, view. In fact, I'm speaking to you from the glass office that you can see uh, just beside the little green tree there. Um, I'm in, that's my office. I'm in there at the moment speaking to you. Um, we've been in operation for just over a year. Last Saturday was our birthday, the 5th of September. Um, and what a year it's been for the whole world, not just for us, um, but quite a challenging year to open a school in. Uh, but we're doing very well and we are really gratified by the response that we're receiving from um, so many pupils uh, who've joined us in the last year. Uh, we've gone from year one right through to year six. Um, ben and Emily, who are with us, are both very busy, very capable classes they, they have uh, with another eight colleagues, all teaching another eight classes. Um, so 10, 10 classes all in all, uh, and we're only just one year in. 
and scope for growth as well on this site. Um, it's an outstandingly well-equipped uh, site. Uh, we, we cover four floors, uh, all beautifully equipped. Nothing has been skimped on, and we would love to show you around. At the end of this um, slideshow, there will be the contact details for us. So do please uh, get in touch and uh, come and have a chat. Um, other people sometimes give uh, these presentations. So this is about me. I always feel a bit awkward about this one. Uh, but yes, I have been a prep school head teacher for quite a long time now. Actually, I've been a head teacher for longer now than I was ever a teacher. Um, it's been that long. Um, and I'm an ISI inspector. ISI is the independent schools inspectorate. Uh, I've been a governor of two independent schools. Uh, both of those governorships I, I gave up um, when I moved out to Hong Kong a little while back because uh, I, it just wouldn't be fair on those two schools. Um, and I've always been a career primary school teacher. At the heart of everything I've done through my career has been an interest in and a focus on primary education. We talk about holistic education a lot, but it's one of those um, phrases that, that tends to bounce around and, and we don't very often drill down into what we actually mean by it. As teachers at Wickham Abbey School, we are very conscious that we are educating the entire child. We are not a primary school that is just pushing for academic results only, although we are a very academic school. But a child who's going to do well in future, particularly at any of the great secondary schools who you'll be hearing from in a while, needs to be a very well-balanced young person commensurate with their aims that they're at at this stage of their development. And in this middle blue column, we have our 12 attributes that we are consistently looking at our pupils at, as people like Ben and Emily are um, looking at their children through the teaching day, as they're marking their work, as they're watching their, the children's performance in class. We're looking to see how is each child stacking up against these developmental areas? Are we developing not only an academically very capable, very bright, very alert person, are we also um, creating a whole person, somebody who will be able to interact well and collaborate well with other people uh, when they are full grown and when they enter the world of business or their professional careers? It's important to point out that as one of the British schools in Hong Kong, we are not an international school. We are licensed as a private school. Uh, now, the difference might seem uh, fairly minimal, uh, but the key part to this is that we are not here purely for the expatriate community. Because we're a private school, we are here to offer a British private education model for Hong Kong children who may be expatriate, but who may also be local Hong Kongs, and we have no limit, there is no quota on us because we are not an international school. Um, and all, for Hong Kong parents, that can be a very important point. We are experts in preparing children for the next stage, and wherever that may be, today we're focusing on British boarding education. I also have children who are looking at moving to Australia, some as boarders, some with their families. Some, there's a lot of movement at the moment between Hong Kong and Singapore. And of course, many of our children, probably the majority, are going to stay here in Hong Kong and go through their secondary careers right here in Hong Kong. And we are preparing them for all of those eventualities. And for some families who are still trying to make up their minds, we're looking at a whole range of options. And that's what we do. Alongside the teaching, alongside the development, we're preparing our families and helping mum and dad with these really quite tricky and uh, these decisions where there's so much information that it's really difficult to, to, to see the wood for the trees sometimes and come down to the, the critical points for decision making. And we're able to assist you and your children in all of these things whilst we are um, making sure that your child is getting an outstanding academic and holistic education. These are the subjects that we teach. Uh, these are the subjects required by the Common Entrance Syllabus, which is the British national curriculum that we follow. And Common Entrance is the examination that most of the independent schools recognise as being the gold standard, although many of them don't actually use Common Entrance. They prefer to uh, uh, create their own uh, 11 plus and 13 plus examinations, but they do, many of them refer to the Common Entrance examination to get the right standard. So it's a very good aiming point for us. 
Of course, Chinese, the second uh, subject there, is, is not um, uh, required by Common Entrance universally, but Common Entrance does require a modern foreign language to English. So of course in Hong Kong, that's going to be Chinese. Um, our teachers uh, have a wide range of experience. Um, most of our teachers are either trained in the UK or have had similar training in other countries. Myself, for example, I trained in South Africa. It's almost exactly the same training as uh, teachers in the UK uh, got in those days, which was quite a long time ago now, I have to say. Uh, but um, for similarly trained teachers, I would um, certainly uh, include uh, teachers from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, some of the states of the United States, um, and of course, uh, UK trained teachers as well. Uh, Hong Kong teachers, uh, I would equally include, if, if they've had uh, experience of the British national curriculum um, as well. Um, so we have a strong tradition of pastoral care, and it comes back to the holistic teaching I was talking about just now, looking after the whole person. If the child is confident in a good place, happy within their own skin, uh, feeling uh, su well supported and uh, that everything in life is, is, is equitable, then we can expect them to make progress. So teachers are really alert to the pastoral care that's given to their pupils. Our main medium of instruction is English, but we teach Chinese a lot. We teach Putonghua with simplified characters. Uh, we have two teachers that go into every class, so we put a double number of teachers into every class, and we teach children either as non-native um, ability children or native speaking ability children in Putonghua. And of course, many children who are Cantonese speaking uh, from Hong Kong are non-native speaking um, in terms of uh, Mandarin, Putonghua. And, and it really doesn't matter. We have a complete range of abilities and we cater for all of them. Uh, the feedback after one year is that the quality of our teaching of Chinese is very high. Some of our children are making faster progress than they were in um, uh, fully, uh, fully Chinese local primary schools. Um, so although we don't teach it all the time, our main medium is English, the feedback is that the uh, care and attention and the investment we've made in teaching Chinese is paying off very well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Chinese is supported by uh, reading in Chinese, our school library. About one third of our school library books are Chinese books. We also promote and look at Chinese culture. You can't expect a child just to learn a language as an academic exercise. They need to be immersed in the culture. Um, and our teaching materials come from mainland China, both for the native speaking uh, ability groups and the non-native speaking ability groups. We've also sourced uh, uh, resources from Singapore, from Taiwan, and here locally in Hong Kong. The topic of today, though, is all about preparing you for boarding. And at Wickham Abbey Hong Kong, we are preparing those families and those children who are either thinking about going to the UK for boarding or who've definitely made up their minds that they are going. Uh, those tend to be the older ones, years five, sixes, and of course the school is developing up into year seven and eight. We can host children here up to 13 plus, which is very useful because many of the British boarding schools some of them start teaching at 11 plus, but most of them only start their borders at 13. So, so what do you do as a Hong Konger or from anywhere else in the world uh, for those two years in between? Well, we can continue to prepare your child here at Wickham Abbey Hong Kong because we have children with us up to year eight, 13, before they transfer across to the UK at 13 if they need to. Of course, if your child wants to start senior school at 11 plus, they can leave us at 11 plus and go to a Hong Kong senior school or a UK senior school or, or anywhere else in the world. We're entirely flexible. And as mum and dad, it gives you um, options. Uh, the picture here is taken from a school, uh, unfortunately not joining us today. This is Sir Priors Field. Uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Andy Vanika, there's a border master. That's a picture of him and two of the girls from Priors Field. Um, and, and these are girls who are clearly uh, from this part of the world, uh, who are making a great success of the boarding house there, which is a, a wonderful boarding house. Um, and, and here at Wickham Abbey, we prepare that academic um, preparation and the life skills preparation to help uh, girls and, board, and boys make great success uh, as boarders. As parents in, 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 in Hong Kong, uh, thinking about sending your child 
uh, to a school so many miles away on the other side of the world, it's good to know that all of these schools are regulated. There are four uh, major societies and associations of head teachers shown here, BSA, the Girls' Schools Association, the HMC, the Headmasters and Headmistresses uh, Conference, and the Society of Heads, which is probably the smallest group, but actually it's the oldest one. And some schools belong to several of these associations. These associations are the quality control of all these schools. They ensure that your child receives an outstanding academic education in a British independent school, that they are safe, that they are secure, that they are very well looked after, in every respect. The independent schools are so highly thought of that Her Majesty's inspector has um, licensed the independent schools, their own inspectorate known as the ISI. Um, and in the introduction, uh, you heard that I, I'm one of the inspectors on the ISI. The independent schools in Britain, the boarding schools and day schools have their own inspectorate, which answers to Ofsted, um, Her Majesty's inspector, but it works um, as a licensed sub body. And uh, these are expert inspectors. Most of them are practicing teachers, heads and deputies who are called up for inspection two or three times a year to make up a team. All highly trained, highly qualified, very rigorous training. And the standards that the schools have to go through are really rigorous. Whenever you go onto an independent school website, look for the inspection reports. Um, I'm very happy to help any parent in Hong Kong uh, to sort of interpret the inspection report for you. Uh, it is written in pretty plain language, but you do need to know uh, the key points to look out for. So uh, do get in touch if, you, if you're exploring a school's website. My advice to you is uh, go. You, they, have, they have to show their uh, ISI reports. Uh, do uh, find the ISI report and do um, ask me for help if, you, if you'd like to. Um, so these are the kinds of things we do. We uh, help you select a school, help you with your application strategy, which can be tricky because these are independent schools. That means they all do things differently. Um, and we help you prepare for interview. Bearing in mind, interview is very important. The academic tests to enter these schools are probably only about a third of the application process. Much of the waiting goes on the interview uh, that your son or daughter will be going through. And these are the issues that we uh, look after here at Wickham Abbey in Hong Kong. A picture of um, Emily Harrison, who's with us today, uh, looking after some of our pupils and, and talking through what it might be like uh, to be a boarder. I'm going to move on quite quickly because I'm conscious that uh, my time stops running out. Some shots of our school, uh, our school hall here on the left. You can see a cutaway design of the building. Do have a look on our website. We have a virtual tour which will take you through. It works like Google Maps. Uh, it's, it's very, uh, I'm, I'm rather proud of it actually. It's cutting edge, uh, created by our birth son, Mr. Jeremy Young. Uh, do have a look at it. It'll take you through the school and there are all kinds of little video clips to show you. Uh, but of course, it's nothing like actually coming to the site. And we do look forward to welcoming you here to the school uh, for a tour to come and see us. Uh, we run a normal school day. Um, we start at eight, teaching at about 8.30, a morning break, a lunchtime. School day finishes at 3 o'clock, or the teaching day finishes at 3 o'clock. And then we have two one-hour uh, extracurricular activity sessions, which include homework. Uh, we have a very straightforward admissions office service. We do not charge for admissions. We don't charge for applications. We don't charge for assessment. Um, and uh, we have tried to make things as non-stressy and as straightforward and easy as possible. And after an assessment, uh, you will receive uh, a reply within 24 hours. There are our um, contact details. Uh, Lisa Tang, our admissions officer, and Wallace will be the people to speak to you. And I believe, Wallace, we've got about five minutes uh, for any questions. Yes. Thank you, Howard. Yes, so let's begin the Q&A session. Uh, we do have some questions coming in already. Uh, so the first question coming up is, uh, what years are offered at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong, and do you have development plans for uh, additional years or secondary school? Yes, thank you. Good question. So currently, uh, we take children from year one. We do not have a kindergarten here, and neither is it our intention to open one. We're a primary school. So British year one, so the children who join us in September are five, um, and we go right through to year six at the moment. Next year, we'll be opening year seven and year eight, going all the way up to 13 plus. So this will be a British 
standard prep school model, uh, five to 13 year olds on this site here in Aberdeen. We do have plans to build a secondary school, a Wickham Abbey secondary school. Um, if you want to get an idea of the size of the campus we're thinking about, uh, do have a look at our Chung Jo, Wickham Abbey Chung Jo website, very easily found. Uh, and to build a, such a vast campus in Hong Kong, that will need to be in the new territories. Uh, we are currently narrowing down the options of the land uh, sites that we have and a decision is imminent and we look forward to having our senior school uh, opening probably in the next couple of years and we hope to make an announcement about a site during this academic year. Uh, thank you Howard. Uh, the next question is uh, what is the relationship between Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong and Wickham Abbey School UK? And uh, the transition as well, if we're, um, their daughter is interested in Wickham Abbey UK, how about uh, could they go into applying and preparing? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's your very lucky afternoon because this afternoon you will be able to put that question to me and to the headmistress of Wickham Abbey in UK. Um, and I know we're going to say exactly the same thing. So uh, we are very much a part of the Wickham Abbey International Group, which consists of Wickham Abbey in the UK, Wickham Abbey Changzhou, Wickham Abbey Nanjing, Wickham Abbey Hangzhou, and Wickham Abbey Hong Kong. There is no automatic transfer from girls from Hong Kong or any of the other international Wickham Abbeys. There is no automatic transfer for our girls to the original Wickham Abbey in UK. Our girls would need to apply in the normal way and we can help you to do that. We have very good relationships uh, with the, the new registrar, this has been a brand new registrar at Wickham Abbey in UK. And of course, Joe Duncan, the head and I know each other, but there are no automatic transfers from us to uh, Wickham Abbey UK. However, we are using the same curriculum that girls in UK who are preparing for entry to schools like Wickham Abbey are using. So by being at the school, you are to all intents and purposes in exactly the same kind of school as all of the girls in England are, uh, who are preparing to enter those schools. So that is a benefit, but it is not a guaranteed pass. Our girls need to apply and they need to go through the process uh, like all other applicants do. And it's very important that we get this decision right. Wickham Abbey is a very high achieving academic school. It wouldn't be for everybody. It wouldn't be a kindness to put every single little girl in there. Um, matching schools are part of the, the, the uh, art of what I do is to help parents match the right child to the match school, uh, match the right the child to the right school. There are over 500 independent schools in Britain, and, and we're able to advise you on many of them and help you find the right school where your child is going to flourish. Um, but I believe I've covered the, the answer. Uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, and the next question is, in terms of extracurricular activities at Wickham Abbey School, do you offer uh, additional foreign languages? Uh, is there sports fields or uh, activities or a uh, football pitch? Um, could you explain more? Yes, so I've just, while Wallace was speaking, I just flicked on to uh, this page, which is a sample of some of the extracurricular activities we offer every afternoon when the school is in session. Uh, we've applied to open with all the other schools in Hong Kong uh, on the 23rd and the 29th of this month. Um, we've, we have applied to run our ECA program in the afternoon. We hope very much that within a few weeks, all of these things will be happening. Uh, I think currently we have 32 ECA activities on offer. Um, if they're offered by a member of staff at the school, they're for free. Uh, if they're offered by an external uh, specialist, uh, then you will pay them. But we would have negotiated a cheaper rate than you would pay if you went there in your private capacity. Um, can I go back? Yes, I can. So I'm just going to flick back. This is our um, part. You can actually, in the top picture here, you can see our entire sports uh, facilities. So you can see the school, main school building on the left hand side where the blue Wickham Abbey sign is. The rooftop uh, next door, we have AstroTurf, we have a red athletics track. The blue part is all for things like basketball and uh, netball, anything that needs bouncing. Um, and if you look carefully down in the bottom right hand corner of that top picture, you can see another court down on ground level. Uh, that court belongs to um, it's a Hong Kong government sports uh, field. It's right next door to our school and we rent it every day through the school day. It's ours to use. Um, so we have for Hong Kong, 
uh, a lot of outdoor um, facilities. We have a full-time PE staff, um, and PE is taught uh, four days out of five for year one and two, uh, two days out of five for the older children, but for longer periods of time. And of course, after school, the ECAs um, will we'll, we'll cover a lot of sporting activities as well. Uh, thank you, Harun. I believe we have only time for one last question. Uh, so last question is, uh, how does Wickham Abbey School help children in Hong Kong uh, move and transition to these boarding schools? Um, and do you have to be a student? Do you offer this service for students that do not go to Wickham Abbey? <laughs> um, I'd like to think my advice is always free. Uh, but, but the answer is that we, we, we would take on our own students professionally. As a head teacher, I can only work with my own students. I couldn't work with the pupils of another head teacher's uh, who belong to another head teacher. That would be um, professionally incorrect. Um, I, I, we're not a, a, an independent agency. So no, I only assist um, our own pupils or the families of our own pupils. Um, it's a long process, uh, but do come, I'm, I'm conscious that we're, we're very short of time now and I need to make way for the next school. Uh, but, but do come and see me um, and we will talk through all the options. We'll start with a long list of schools. We'll narrow it down. Uh, to schools that would match the characteristics and abilities of your child. Uh, we will help you make contact. You would have to make contact yourself because generally the schools won't speak to us straight away. They would want to hear from you, mum and dad, but I would always be at your elbow to help you and advise and to put in whatever information or contact we needed along the way. And all children at the school will be prepared for boarding in the UK if we know that that's uh, what you're intending. But do come and see me and, uh, and we can talk more fully. Whether you're, a pupil, whether you're a parent at the school or not, I would be happy to, to meet you. I'd love to meet you, show you around our school, have a cup of coffee, and, uh, and talk to you about the process. Thank you, Wallet. Uh, Howard, before I let you go, uh, do you have any uh, parting words for our guests? Thank you, Wallace. Yeah, my parting words are, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the first speaker, so do enjoy the rest of the afternoon. I'm very excited uh, about the uh, schools we'll be hearing from through the day. Uh, great girls boarding schools. Um, we've, we've got to know the people you're speaking to quite well over the last few weeks as we've been preparing. I would like to thank all speakers for their preparation. Um, but to the Hong Kong families, uh, do come and see us. We would love to meet you, love to show you our school. Um, and, and we're right here, easily found in Aberdeen. And I look forward to meeting you. Do enjoy the rest of the uh, webinar and do join us next week at the same time for the boys schools. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you very much, Howard. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mrs. Ellie Llewellyn, who is the Director of Boarding, Operations and Compliance at Down House. Ellie is a psychology teacher and higher education advisor who has worked in various secondary institutions, both in the UK and Beijing, settling at Down House for the past six years. Ellie has a passion for helping young people to navigate the complex world of higher education options and believes single sex boarding provides the perfect platform for success beyond secondary school. Fantastic, thank you so much for that warm introduction there, Ben. Um, I'm just gonna get my PowerPoint up for you so that you can all see that. Fantastic, so, um, Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Um, I am indeed the uh, Director of Boarding here at uh, Down House. Um, I was so pleased actually when Howard asked me to uh, present today um, as it means I get to spend the, uh, the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes talking about a subject that I am incredibly passionate about, uh, which is um, how boarding schools prepare their young women for the future. So um, here at Down House, I'm also um, a sixth form housemistress um, and a higher education advisor. So I spend a lot of time with our older girls um, who are obviously imminently uh, due to leave us and, and uh, start their exciting journeys beyond our school gates. So I really do have quite a vested interest in ensuring that they are fully prepared for what is to come. And I think now more than ever, uh, as we navigate our way through a global pandemic, um, we've been able to see actually how our girls have been able to put many of their skills to the test showing really great resilience, perseverance, and overcoming those challenges and embracing the opportunities that digital learning um, provided to us um, at the start of the lockdown. 
We are now back in session. We are open and our girls are with us and it's so rewarding to see them again um, and how adaptable um, they have been and, and they are still being now. We see that that is a great indication that they are successfully navigating this global pandemic um, and that we're probably then on the right track in terms of the skills development that we've been doing with them. So here at Down, we have always understood the really important role that a school plays in forming the foundations of skills that our students will go on to use throughout their lives. Um, and we do this in so many different ways. However, um, we wanted to be able to easily show our parents um, and prospective parents, as well as our girls, uh, a tangible document um, that talks about all of the things that we do offer. And so um, that was where our World Ready program um, was born from. All of the skills building activities that we mention in our World Ready brochure, and we're gonna go through some of those today, uh, were already in existence at the school. But breaking the skills down into these five um, key skill sets allows us to really constantly question um, how we address those skill skills areas um, and that allows us to ensure that our girls are well prepared for life outside of the school gates. Now, I can't possibly go through with you all that is on offer for our girls here at Down House, as we would literally be here all week, I think. Um, but I do hope that in the time that I do have, I can give you just a glimpse, um, a bit of a flavour of what we do within these five skill set areas to help support our girls um, and develop those specific skills that they will need um, out in the, the real world. So if I start with um, academic skills. So here at Down, we recognise just how important it is for girls to be self-aware about their own academic skills. And whilst our amazing teachers here equip our girls with those skills routinely through um, the overt teaching um, as well as feedback and the support they give. We also offer a whole host of ways uh, for our girls to develop their academic skills outside of the classroom. So we have a really varied selection of student run clubs, um, including things like debating, law society, medic society, to name just a few. Um, we feel those really help the girls to gain exposure to academic content that they might otherwise not encounter through their A-level studies. We also deliver an incredible elective programme, um, and that's what you can see there on the, um, the slide, where girls can sign up to attend lectures and workshops on topics which might pique their interest outside of their curriculum subjects. So last year's programme included sessions ranging from the physics of transport uh, through to the greats of Russian literature. So it's a really varied mix um, and it really does challenge the intellectually curious, which is the, the strap line we, we gave to the elective programme. In the lower sixth, um, we also take our girls through a six week higher education and research skills um, programme, which we call HERS which focuses on ensuring that the girls can hit the ground running with their A-level studies um, by looking at how to develop skills such as referencing, um, effective note-taking, critical thinking, and presentation skills. Not only does this help the girls adapt to the more rigorous nature of A-level, but it also gives them a head start if they choose to go on to university, which can otherwise be quite a daunting prospect and can be quite different in terms of how you learn uh, from A-level. So we also offer uh, the extended project qualification, uh, the EPQ, uh, which around half of our lower sixth will undertake in addition to their A-level subjects. This, again, is a great way for them to delve deeper into an area which interests them and is not restricted by the confines of a curriculum. Moving on then to life skills. So life skills are, of course, modelled um, to the students in, in all that we do and all of the staff that they come into contact with. Um, especially uh, that being the case, I think, in boarding schools where the girls are with their pastoral and academic staff um, throughout the day. Um, and uh, often at the weekends as well. 
However, we also have a Learning for Life programme, uh, which is often um, referred to as uh, PSHE uh, in other schools, which all of our girls attend each week. Um, and through that, we're able to teach the girls uh, topics like online safety or managing relationships, the importance of finding balance and maintaining well-being. This then runs alongside our well-being program that we offer, which includes in-house well-being resources, well-being activities like yoga and mindfulness, as well as educational lectures and workshops that the girls can attend. In the sixth form, that program develops into an age-appropriate uh, enrichment lecture program, which covers topics like um, gap year safety, if they want to take a gap year before university, <clears throat> as well as what to expect at university. Um, and we do a presentation called How to Survive Your First uh, Weeks at University. Uh, so really thinking about the skills that they're going to need to, to use uh, once they leave the, the school gates. Tailored guidance um, is also given to um, our girls through our tutor system, which sees um, each of our girls having an allocated tutor uh, who sees them for uh, about 30 minutes a week to discuss academic matters. Um, so that's a one-to-one -one process. This is a really crucial relationship for our girls uh, and they have it from day one um, when they join us. Uh, right through um, to the upper sixth before they leave us. It allows them to reflect on their educational journey um, and receive guidance on how to keep challenging themselves, both um, academically um, and pastorally. Tutors uh, may focus on specific skills with their tutees, helping to um, build things like organisational skills, time management skills, um, or maybe encouraging them uh, to create balance between their academic commitments and their extracurricular activities. This relationship then supports the key work of the boarding staff, who also offer excellent in, uh, an excellent in-house programme uh, for the girls, which is uh, age appropriate as well. The boarding staff and tutors are also helped by um, our AS tracking data, uh, which is gathered from our girls twice a year. Uh, and helps to track their mental well-being. All of our girls have access to um, our DH Links programme, which is our uh, alumni, parents and careers network. Uh, and this allows girls to develop contacts and opportunities for things like work experience, um, to do uh, masterclasses, or simply to ask for advice from someone who works in um, an industry that they may be looking at um, joining later in life. Many of the things I have already discussed cross over under this um, skills heading of metacognitive skills. Um, but we do offer a couple of opportunities to our girls that I really wanted uh, to touch upon here, which help them to develop the ability to really think about their own thinking, um, being reflective and being able to act upon that reflection. So our mentoring program here uh, offers our lower six girls the opportunity to train to become either an academic mentor or a pastoral mentor. Not only do those um, roles help them develop their soft skills, but a key part of the training that we offer them is that they have to be able to reflect on their own experiences, on their own skills, um, and then be able to go on to say what they have learned from them in order to be able to better support their peers. These are really highly transferable skills, which they can then take with them into university or, or beyond into the workplace. And I'm always so pleased when one of my old girls contacts me to say that she is now a peer mentor at her university, for example, or that she uh, was able to talk about her experiences of um, mentoring and the skills that she learned at a job interview. Positions of um, leadership, are also a great way uh, of a girl developing her metacognitive skills and our seniors, um, often known as prefects um, at other schools, all undertake training which encourages them to think about how they can be effective in their positions of responsibility, uh, analysing what has gone before and seeing where they can make uh, a positive impact. 
Being a role model for their peers also encourages them to think about their actions and take responsibility for the impact that they can have on others. Our seniors often learn a really valuable lesson actually um, by undertaking their roles that leadership is not necessarily as easy as it might look from the outside. Soft skills, um, these are learned in so many ways, um, but some of the exciting opportunities that our girls have, um, particularly as they get up into the sixth form and start their um, A-levels, really um, things like compassion, teamwork, um, and those all important communication skills. Many of our girls choose to take up one of the extracurricular activities that we offer um, from Gold Duke of Edinburgh Award uh, to the Leith's Cookery Qualification um, and uh, Young Enterprise is another um, popular choice. Each one of those um, is designed to really help equip them with a whole host of skills that they can then um, develop and apply to situations that they encounter in the future. So the last of the five um, core skill sets that we look at is employment skills. Um, and this is something we really start to expose our girls to right from the start of their journey with us at Downhouse. Um, and obviously intensifying as they join us in the sixth form um, and are uh, imminently uh, leaving us. Our higher education program is really extensive. Um, it starts with um, things like careers talks and presentations um, when the girls are lower down the school. It moves into um, some psychometric uh, profiling um, and work experience in the upper school and then culminates in a really tailored specialist one-to-one -one higher education guidance when they join us in the sixth form. We have a whole range of specialist advisors for UK applications, overseas applications, creative and Oxbridge applicants. Uh, though those specialists are all there to fully support the, the girls as an individual and ensure that her choices help to set her on the path that she wants in terms of her career aspirations. So from lectures to interview workshops um, to actually an entire higher education day uh, that we do with our lower sixth girls, the girls really are equipped to make informed choices uh, about their future. We also offer the Ivy House Award to our sixth form girls uh, to help them recognise their potential and be proactive in managing their own destiny. The girls who complete the course regularly feed back to us um, how much of what they learned they still apply in their daily lives, uh, even if they're now at university or they've gone on to the workplace. So alongside um, all of the skills building activities that we offer, um, there is also a whole range of experiences um, for our girls to take part in, which help them to see outside the gates of uh, Down House and into the world that they will inevitably entering, uh, be entering once they leave us. So our girls have lots of opportunities to socialise uh, with other schools, um, and that's both on an academic level um, as well as a, a pastoral and, and social level. There is a whole school focus on charity and outreach, and each of our boarding houses uh, has a charity that they raise money for, um, and they even visit um, around the world uh, on a regular basis as well. Our academic departments offer trips to extend the curriculum and put theory into practice too, uh, which has seen our girls visiting some incredible places, uh, most recently uh, places like Iceland uh, and Russia. We also have an incredibly popular global schools exchange program. Um, that's for our year 10 and 11 girls, and that sees them um, going off to experience school life across the globe, um, from Japan to the USA, um, and we very much enjoy um, hosting uh, the girls in return here at Downhouse too. So we have 16 partner schools um, and counting um, who help to give our girls excellent exposure uh, to other cultures and other ways of living, um, and they are often truly once in a lifetime transformative experiences for the girls um, that undertake them. 
The programme then develops in our sixth form into um, what we call our Global Internships programme. Um, and that sees girls, uh, again, heading off around the world uh, to places like Canada, Hong Kong um, and Australia. Uh, just to name a few, where they get to experience um, a taste of working uh, internationally at some incredible multinational companies. Um, our year eight girls also experience uh, a term in France at our school there, Sauveter, um, uh, and that's often um, one of the first times our girls will have had a, a truly immersive uh, experience in another country. And they leave their term there with not only impressive language skills, um, but lifelong memories of the experiences that they've, that they've had whilst they're there uh, and that they've gained from developing a real understanding of a different culture and a different way of life. Um, so again, an amazing experience for our girls to be able to, uh, to undertake that helps equip them um, with those uh, uh, skills for being outward looking. So I will leave it there. <laughs> um, I could literally talk all day about how girls boarding uh, can prepare um, girls for their futures, but um, hopefully this has given you a bit of a flavor um, for what uh, boarding schools can offer and reassured you actually that if you are considering girls boarding, then you are absolutely making the right decision. <laughs> I may be a little biased there, <laughs> but uh, that's certainly, certainly my opinion. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, so we'll begin the Q&A session of uh, your presentation today. And uh, I'll begin with the first question. Um, so the first question is for Downhouse. Uh, how does the school make sure that students are healthy and how strong is the pastoral care, especially uh, during a time such as this and, and during normal days? So, um I think it's, so I mentioned the, um, the tutor system that we have here, the academic one-to-one um, -one tutoring system, which is a, a big part of the um, pastoral care that we offer. Um, our boarding houses um, all have um, a, a team of resident uh, boarding staff um, who get to know the girls incredibly well. Um, obviously, we are a full boarding school, so the girls are with us um, not only through the week, but also at the weekends, um, where they have a, a huge array of activities on offer. Um, and they get to spend a lot of time with their, uh, with their boarding staff and with each other. So um, from a pastoral point of view, we know our girls incredibly well and uh, we are very much child centered. So um, the care that we offer um, fits uh, each individual girl um, as, she, as she needs it. Um, I think that answered the question, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Ellie. Uh, great, uh, next question is, um, what are the years of entry available at Downhouse and what years would you recommend for entry? So we offer um, uh, entry at uh, 11, 12 and 13 plus. Um, we, we don't make a recommendation for which of those years um, you should join us. What we say is that if you are happy, if your, your daughter is happy in the, the, um, the prep school or the, the junior school that she's in and she wants to stay there until she's um, 13, then that's absolutely the right decision for you and we will welcome her at that stage. If you're in a school that doesn't go up to that high and you want to join us at 11 plus, again, we would absolutely welcome you at that stage. It's got to be right for the student. Um, Sometimes uh, if students have been at a, a junior school or a prep school, um, they need to experience going all the way through um, up to year 13. Um, they're really maybe quite excited about being the head of the school um, and that might be able to teach them some additional responsibility, uh, etc. So if that's the right choice to stay at that school and then join us at 13 plus, that's absolutely fine. Um, the only thing I would say is we do offer our term in France um, during the 12 plus year. So that is something that tempts um, some of our, our prospective students and parents in um, because they want to be able to take part in that um, at the 12 plus stage. Thank you. And just to clarify, uh, would uh, a child at year 10 be able to apply for entry? Um, we, we don't uh, tend to take entry at that stage. Um, uh, 
the, the uh, official entry uh, stages that we have are um, 11, 12, uh, 13 plus, and then 16 plus. So they could join us uh, as a new student in the sixth form. Um, but obviously with GCSEs, um, we wouldn't advise that that's the right time uh, to join a new school. Understood, thank you. Um, and next question is in terms of diversity at your school, um, what is the ratio between uh, you know, the different ethnicities at your school? And then on second, on top of that is, uh, how many Hong Kongers do you uh, usually have at your school population? Okay, so we, um, we have uh, between kind of 15 to 20% of tier four visa holders. Um, so uh, um, within that um, field, we have a really eclectic mix of girls from all over the world. Um, Hong Kong nationals are um, uh, probably our biggest uh, intake group. It does differ um, from year to year. Um, but yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be around 15 to 20% that are international. And of that, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess of what it is at the moment, I'm afraid, um, specifically for Hong Kong, but they are the biggest intake group within our international um, uh, field. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Um, it's regarding the school's policy on uh, bullying. How are such incidents handled at Downhouse? So um, I think we're, we're very lucky um, here that because of the, the type of um, care, the, the pastoral care that the girls get, um, we do have very few incidences of, of bullying, um, but they do happen. Um, I, I think there's no point in denying that. They happen in all schools. Um, and when they do, it's very much about, um, with our child-centered approach, it, it's really about talking to the girls involved and finding out more information about um, why it's occurring and, and what's happening and then putting structures in place um, to to try and help resolve um, any issues that um, have come about uh, between students um, we obviously as all schools i'm sure will have um, a, a rigorous um, uh, system um, for uh, dealing with uh, poor behavior if we should encounter it but, but often at the heart of it, it's about talking to the girls. Um, you know, we, we don't jump straight in with a punishment for something. We want to find out why so that we can ensure that it doesn't happen again in the future. Um, and that approach um, seems to work for us really well. Um, and it allows our girls to be able to learn um, some emotional um, lessons and be able to move forward. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, and the next question is just to clarify for some of our viewers, uh, what curriculums uh, are offered at Downhouse and uh, for um, testing for A-levels, uh, pre-U, when should uh, the girls choose which exam type to be taking? Okay, so um, for GCSE, we follow the um, uh, GCSE and I GCSE curriculum. So we have a, a mixture of the two um, curriculums. And then in the sixth form, we have predominantly A-levels. Um, we currently do have, I think, a couple of pre-U qualifications, um, but we, we have been moving uh, more towards um, A-level curriculums. Um, and we obviously follow the two-year uh, linear uh, A-levels, which are now in place uh, in the UK. Um, so in terms of, sorry, was the question if a girl is joining us, when do they decide which subjects to do? Or do you mean if there's a choice because there, there isn't a choice, they would be following A-level? I, I believe it was if there was a choice. <laughs> so. Okay, so no, we, we, don't, we don't offer the IB. So they, if they're coming to us in the sixth form, they just choose their subjects for A-level. Understood, thank you, Ali. And I believe uh, we probably have uh, enough time for one more question. Uh, the last question is, how do you prepare girls for the future? Uh, and uh, a second question on top of that is, what universities do uh, the girls that, grad that leave Downhouse typically enter? Okay, so um, how do we prepare girls for the future? I mean, hopefully my presentation covered some of the, the things that we do. Um, I mean, the future um, is a, a complete unknown. Um, however, um, the, the approach that, that we take as a school is that if we can equip the girls with those transferable skills, then it really doesn't matter what they encounter, um, what career they end up uh, going into, they will have those core skills to help them 
deal with that um, and face any challenges and opportunities that, that come their way. Um, obviously, we, we live in a world where technology is moving so fast and um, industries uh, are developing and changing. And we may well have girls leaving us now that end up in a job that doesn't even exist at the moment. So we couldn't possibly equip them with um, uh, the, the right knowledge for those jobs necessarily, but we can equip them with the skills uh, that are transferable and, and can be uh, applied to any situation that they go into. Um, sorry, Wallace, remind me the second part of the question. Is uh, what universities do uh, girls that leave down has typically enter? Okay, so the vast majority of our girls go on to um, what we call Russell Group uh, Universities uh, in the UK. Um, and when I say the majority, um, that's generally kind of uh, mid 90s. Uh, percentage wise uh, would be going into um, one of our one of the Russell group uh, universities um, so the cohort that have just gone through for example um, our most popular university was uh, Exeter um, in terms of um, uh, kind of to give you a bit more destination analysis uh, type information um, the vast majority of our girls this year um, and and indeed in previous years uh, get their first choice university um, as well so um, we do have uh, within uh, our cohort every year in the upper sixth, we will have girls that apply for um, more creative um, courses. So um, they might go on to do an art foundation or a drama foundation or a music uh, course. Um, we always have uh, an Oxbridge cohort, uh, which this year was incredibly healthy. All of the girls that applied to Oxbridge got their places, which is fantastic. Um, the um, other uh, areas overseas, um, universities, uh, which uh, changes, is a bit of a changing picture with all the things that are happening um, globally uh, and in the UK, um, but we, we always have a, a healthy overseas cohort um, with girls going off um, around the world. Uh, the US tends to be our most popular destination, but we've seen in recent years Canada growing in popularity uh, as well. We have girls that go to Australia, Europe. Um, so. Uh, we, we, our team here is fully equipped to deal with um, anything uh, in terms of where the girls might want to go. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, so before I let you go, do you have any last words for our attendees? Just that I hope you really enjoy the rest of the, um, the presentations today. Um, from a, a Downhouse uh, specific point of view, if you'd like to know anything more about Downhouse, please do get in contact with us. Um, our amazing um, uh, uh, head of admissions, um, Mrs. Angela Nutt, would be overjoyed to hear from you um, and can certainly answer any more specific questions if you have any about the process for um, applying or finding out more um, about Downhouse specifically. Thank you very much, Ellie. And our next speaker for today is Emma Van Bergen. Emma is president of education consultancy at BE Edu e Education. Emma co-founded BE Education with William Van Bergen in 2003. As an expert in international education, she has been a consultant for nearly 17 years and has been an educational co columnist for the Wall Street Journal and other international media. In addition to helping children from Chinese families with overseas education consulting, she is also a consultant to many international and top boarding schools. Welcome, Emma. Hello, everyone. So today I wanted to focus on preparing children for all-round success at boarding school. By all-round success, I mean um, much more than just the academics, which obviously in Hong Kong tends to take the president and the bulk of the time and effort uh, when it comes for, to, for families preparing their children to go abroad. But I think it's just as important to prepare children um, for, for tra the transition and to prepare them so that when they get to the boarding school, they can be uh, as successful as possible and really slot into life there and um, take it by the reins and make the most of it. So I've sort of um, identified a few key elements that uh, really influence the ability of a child to um, transition well and to have a stress-free and rather happy life at uh, boarding school. And these are self-organization, time management ability, obviously social ability. Social ability is key when you're living in a boarding school independent skills, having a genuine interest in extracurricular activities because they're so abundant at boarding schools, 
and having a positive attitude about the experience and just generally um, the idea of studying abroad and studying over, uh, overseas. Um, obviously, we can't ignore the fact that students need to be well prepared for their academics and their English. And I think finally, one of the key um, sort of uh, factors in ch children's success once they're at a boarding school is how their parents support them and help them from afar. Um, because ultimately, um, they are still your children and you uh, still have to sort of give them the support and, and the um, encouragement to keep going in their new environment. So self-organization and time management, I sort of split it into these two areas in that I think that time management um, is definitely something that a lot of students struggle with when they first get to boarding school. I would say that in younger years, particularly in prep schools in year seven, eight and nine, schools do help a lot with um, helping students understand how to manage their homework, how to organize it, what to do and when. But obviously as students get older, they are expected to be able to do this on their own. And this is for the simple reason that they are being prepared for university and at university there's nobody around to help them do this. So um, I think students need to know what to prepare for class for each section of the day. They need to think about what extracurriculars they have going on and therefore what do they need to pack in their, in their school bag and what do they need to take to class. Um, they also need to think about which homework needs completing when, so they're turning it in on time. And finally, making sure they keep uh, track of their belongings, books, clothing. Anybody who's visited a boarding school will have wandered around a dorm and seen random shoes lost and a very interesting and sort of strange collection of things and lost and uh, found. So I think it's bound to happen that students lose things, but we can still help prepare them before they go overseas. So I think in Hong Kong, one of the largest um, contributors probably to children not being super in, um, well prepared in this particular aspect is the helper um, dynamic. Uh, we all have helpers at home um, helping us and our, our kids keep uh, themselves on task and making sure they're well prepared. And I think at some point we need to ask our helpers to help our children help themselves rather than just doing it for them. So I suggest that we can sort of task a helper with asking questions of the child. You know, what do you need tomorrow? What do you have on at school? What uh, kit is needed? Do you have any special assignments that need handing in? Um, homework as well. I found that a lot of students have a tutor or a, even a parent who sits alongside them who sort of looks through the homework that they've been given that day and then decides what needs doing and when. This is a skill that really a student who's in their teens should be able to do themselves. And again, it's about asking your child, let's have a look, when are these things due? What's due first? Let's prioritize. And helping them ask themselves the right questions to do that um, so that when they get to school in England, they're not completely overwhelmed. I think the other thing um, is taking responsibility for your own belongings as a child. Obviously, this takes time and it's a habit that we have to grow. A helper can check and see that everything is packed and we haven't forgotten everything, but it should be the child's first responsibility to think, have I packed everything? Have I left anything? Do I have everything I need to take home or to take to school with me? So I think um, one of the things is really trying to guide a helper in terms of helping them train the child to do these things for themselves rather than just doing it for themselves, uh, for the child. Another area that's really important, obviously in boarding school is um, social ability. Um, in the past, I have sent students to schools in England where they've really struggled to connect with the locals or just um, they've had a gap in terms of social maturity. And I found that this often comes from children who are very over tutored and have very little spare time on their hands. Where students really struggle and where they tend to get into trouble is when they have a lot of spare time and they're not used to this spare time and they don't know how to organize it productively. So whilst I understand there is an important um, element to preparing your child to go abroad, which is academics and where they do need to learn stuff and often things that aren't covered in their academics and their curriculum at school, it's also important to make sure they have time to socialize with other children, to make sure they have free time that they can organize on their own or to give them options. So what would you like to do? We have two hours free on Saturday afternoon. What are you gonna do that's productive with it? So that they don't really struggle to come up with productive um, uses of that time when they get to the UK. 
Um, the other thing that I've found is that children who are not used to having much spare time, they often then fall into the trap of playing games or going on the computer or just mixing with the wrong people um, at school. So it's really important that parents take their time and set up play dates with kids from uh, local in Hong Kong and foreigners and really give your child an opportunity to interact and meet people from different walks of life, from different backgrounds and make them sort of exercise and um, th those social skills and uh, get used to making new friends and get used to interacting with different people. A superb place to do this is obviously summer camp. And Hong Kong normally without COVID is absolutely chock-a-block of summer camps over the summer from academic ones to, I think this, this summer, unfortunately we didn't attend, but there were marine biology ones, there's forest ones, there's a whole array of camps. And again, asking your child to pick some that are of interest, like coding maybe, and then pick others that might be supportive academically is a great way to get a good mixture of both the fun and the academic and enriching side. But also it throws your child into a situation where they don't know anyone, where they have to make new friends, and where they have to integrate and learn how to get on with new people. There are obviously loads of camps as well overseas. So for older students, I really recommend taking the time to go overseas. And that does fit with one of my points later, whereby you know going to a boarding school for a taster experience, it's a great way of getting your child onto the idea and invested in the idea of studying abroad. But also it's a great way of meeting kids from all over Europe, from all over England, from all walks of life and all different countries. And it's a great way of testing their skills in terms of boarding. Um, but I think the more socially able a child and the more social opportunities they've been given to sort of step into and learn from, the more confident they are about the study abroad experience. And generally what that means is that they're much more com uh, comfortable and less stressed about the idea of going overseas. Uh, independent skills, obviously very important. A child needs to learn how to look after themselves and rely on themselves in the first instance. Um, I think when children are small, their first go-to point is obviously their parents. But as kids get older, it's important that they start thinking, actually, I can solve this problem. I'm capable enough to solve this problem. And I'm confident enough to an approach an adult when I have a problem and try and solve this problem on my own. Um, I think this is easily done in Hong Kong at home, um, where you encourage your child, if they come home and they've got a problem at school, the question would be, well, how can we solve this? How can you deal with your teacher and get to the bottom of this or how do we fix this? And you can support them and help brainstorm with them, but encourage them to actually do the problem solving and the interaction with the teachers themselves. This is really important, I think, when it gets to um, boarding school because once children are at boarding school, there are a plethora of adults and resources that they can go to when they have a problem, whether it's homesickness, whether it's an academic problem, whether it's a problem with English. There are many parent, uh, teachers, tutors, and support staff on site who are there for the specific reason to support your child. And I think um, the child's most important decision and ability is the willingness to go up to these people and ask for help. And if they have that sense and they have that confidence, then there's very little that can't be solved within the school itself. Ultimately, calling mum and dad from Britain and asking for help solving a problem, of course it can be done. And of course, children will do that when, when, when they really get stuck with the problem. But it shouldn't be their first response to when, uh, when they are faced with a problem. So what I suggest is that children are encouraged from a young age to speak up for themselves, to order in restaurants, to do simple things like if they're lost or they need to know where something is, to ask questions of adults and to know how to do it politely and to do it effectively. And of course, when they're in Hong Kong and when they're by your side, you can accompany them and give them that sort of emotional support they need when they're first trying it out. But um, it's something that you can encourage from a, a really young age and it just becomes second nature for a child, that independence and that proactive ability to solve their own problems. I also think it's great to get your child involved in organizing their own schedule and activities. I know that we like to keep them full and busy each day, but I think choice is another key sort of um, helper here. Give them a selection of things and help them take control of which ones they want to do and maybe when, when they want to have some free time, when they want to do certain things. Um, obviously, some children need encouragement to continue on with, with a particular pursuit. Um, I know that musical instruments are one of those that start slow and many a child wants to give up. 
but um, and obviously as parents we want to encourage them to keep going but um, I think giving them some choice really does help uh, because when they get um, to boarding school in England, they will be given such an amazing uh, abundance of activities to take part in. They need to know where to begin and where to start organizing themselves. I think this goes on from what I just said. I, I, I think a genuine interest in extracurricular activities is so important. Um, a lot of parents, particularly in Hong Kong, seem to push their children into a particular activity and then become somewhat um, obsessed with getting grades in, the area, in that area. I think that's all very well. I think it's very important that the child is interested in it though. And this actually um, influences the admissions process. When a child has an interview and is talking about their pursuits and their interests in certain uh, activities, it is very important important that there is passion and enthusiasm coming from the child. It is really sad whenever I interview a child to see that basically they're doing piano because they've been told to and there's a, very, a great lack of um, passion behind actually the, the, the subject and when it comes down to it, when they get the option in England often to do, um, uh, to do different activities or to continue with that activity, many of them choose to give up or they say, I have no interest in anything else because it becomes more of a chore than an activity. So I think that finding that, that ba balance between something your child is passionate about and really keen on and really in, you know, encouraging them to take it further and forcing a child down a path that is potentially not of their interest, it really needs to be found um, because then you have a child who will not only be very open to new activities when they get to their new school, but also very keen to continue doing the activities that they've already done when they've been at home and do them with great fun. And I would say the happiest kids in Britain are definitely, and the ones that integrate best, are those with a plethora of extracurricular activities or at least one that they're really enthusiastic about. They get to know friends through the activity, they get to um, have a social life through the activity and they're kept busy by the activity so they don't get that um, homesick and they don't worry about home and think of home too often. Um, having a positive attitude about going abroad is absolutely imperative. Obviously children will go abroad at different times and at different stages in their life and their educational career. But um, I think it's really important that if, if your plan, even if it's a long-term plan, is to send your child abroad or overseas that your child buys into this actually from quite a young age. So I always recommend that parents um, involve their child in the process of school selection. Your child should feel that they have an opinion and that their feelings about schools are important. And whenever possible, obviously it's quite difficult at the time being with COVID, but whenever possible, when you visit a school or when you plan visits to school, take your child with you. There is nothing more motivational than actually seeing one of these great schools in, in session and seeing the kids out having fun and getting the excitement and the enthusiasm from the other students. Um, they really are very special places and they sell themselves just by visiting them. Enormous campuses, great uh, facilities, lovely boarding houses. I think that always puts my kids my interest and most of all happy students generally. So that really helps when it comes to picking schools. I, I would also say that in Hong Kong, we're blessed to have loads of students studying overseas, particularly in the UK. So it's a good idea if you have friends with killed children overseas to bring them together to meet your kid, to have a chat, very casual of course, but just to give them an idea of what it's like and to show that it's a positive experience and that this child is really flourishing and confident and happy about their experience. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, summer courses are a great opportunity to try out boarding. Um, this helps when it comes to actually deciding when it's right for your child to study overseas. Some kids are ready sooner than others, um, but it also lets the child experience what is boarding like? What is it like to be in one of these boarding houses? What is the food like? What is it like to live on campus? And what is it like to be reliant on myself for two or three weeks? And again, in England, I think most schools run summer courses and there are some really great ones for all different levels and all different ages. So from about the age of seven or eight, you can actually consider sending them overseas to um, a, a small boarding um, experience for the summer. 
Now, academic present preparation, it can't be ignored because obviously it's a super important element to actually getting into the school, which is the first step when it comes to overseas um, study. I would say that most schools in, in Hong Kong are pretty well connected with the UK curriculum. And therefore, when it actually comes to, to starting at the school, most children don't have a huge gap. I think particularly this is one of the reasons I encourage year nine entry, year nine entry or year seven entry, there is um, plenty of time for the child to catch up on any gaps or any subjects they've missed. They've got a year with no major entrance exams and that helps um, ease the transition and helps plug any gaps in their knowledge from curriculum reasons. But for entrance test preparation, I would say, don't overdo it. It's definitely best to start early. And I would point out that some schools now register two or three years in advance and have an, a pretest two or three years in advance. So you're looking at a 10 or 11 year old taking a pretest. And those pretests are generally based on cognitive ability, um, reasoning, both verbal and nonverbal, and basic English and math skills. So these are areas that um, children need to, to do a little preparation for before they, they actually take the pretest. It definitely works better in those smaller children to, do, uh, to work over a period of time and to make sure that they're doing little by little rather than overwhelming them with a, a cramming sort of session over the summer. Um, I think it works, A, the child can train for longer, can get used to the type of questions for longer, and it's a far less stressful experience. And of course, we don't want to associate tests and stressful experience and tutoring with English schools in particular. So certainly starting well in advance is important. Um, I would say most students start a year before their first test. So again, for some kids, it's actually quite young when you're talking about having a pretest when you're 10 or 11. Uh, for interview preparation, I say don't overdo it. Um, this is a common over sort of done area, particularly in Hong Kong drilling children or rehearsing answers with them, it really doesn't bode well when it comes to the interview. It's pretty obvious when a child has been overly um, prepared and overly drilled on certain questions. But what as parents we can do is we can talk to our children at home about things like current affairs. So what's going on in the world, what's happening around us so that your child isn't just within a bubble and just aware of what's going on in their school life or whatever. I think, you know, chatting with parents and watching the news together, it's a great way of just getting a small insight into the world as a whole. I really recommend encouraging reading. Reading is so helpful when it comes to even the pretest. It builds vocabulary. It's an area for discussion for interviews. It's a great way of cleaning up grammar and punctuation in a sort of passive manner. And you can always read along with your child and talk to them about topics or themes from the book and really have a chat about it. And they'll get into reading if you're reading with them and you're interested. And the other thing, as I said, make sure they are genuinely passionate about what they're doing extracurricularly. Even if it's just one or two um, uh, subjects or activities that they're super interested in, it's really important that they have those one or two that they can talk about with huge enthusiasm, huge animation, and really connect with an um, a interviewer when they're in that position. Uh, when it comes to English, um, obviously Hong Kongese English generally is very strong, I think particularly when it comes to um, other international applicants English. However, what I've noticed over the last few years is that where the Hong Kongese tend to struggle a little bit is in literary analysis. So most children can handle a comprehension piece quite easily at a reasonable level. So within an age of a year of their um, reading age. But where they really struggle is on understanding deeper themes and nuances in literature. A lot of them, um, students don't actually do poetry analysis at schools and um, they don't understand inferences in text and they can't necessarily pick out uh, literary techniques and why those literary techniques are used and what um, the purpose of them is. So again, reading does help, um, but this requires practice. It requires somebody to sort of give you a, an, a guidance in terms of how to do it. And it is not normally covered in school's curriculum. So um, I would say this is probably only relevant for the very top schools after, uh, English papers, but it is very important. And um, it's not enough to just be able to understand a piece of writing and answer questions on the meaning of it. You have to understand those deeper themes and the nuances that the literature brings. And again, a higher standard of reading will help with this just in general. 
but also doing some practice papers and doing some comprehension that is more literature based and more actually of the standard that the British kids will be doing themselves is hugely useful. And finally, I just want to talk about parental support. So um, obviously once your child is in school, it's important that as parents that we're in touch with them regularly um, and that we're, you know, the greatest supporters in life. One of the things I think sometimes really throws a child is when a parent sets an unreasonable academic expectation from day one. Remember that when your child goes to a new school, it's a new environment, it's a new challenge, it's a completely different uh, way of living that they're not used to, they're on their own. Give them some time to settle in, to make new friends, to get their activities together, to really get used to school life. And then they will, when they're happy and settled, they will start showing their academic ability, whatever that is. So I think that expecting you know, perfect grades from day one is just, it's a, a stress that your child doesn't necessarily need from day one particularly if they're going when they're year nine. There's no need for it. They can develop over that year and really start hitting their stride probably you know, towards the second term. Um, I would also not focus just on academic results initially. Focus on whether your child is happy. Focus on whether they're settling well. Make sure they're getting their friends. Make sure they're comfortable and they're dealing with the day-to-day -day issues well. You know, the, the sooner they're more settled, the sooner those academic results will follow. Happy children perform well. That's typically the case. So once they're happy and settled, you can, um, you can be sure that they'll start performing to the best of their ability. Uh, if a child is under working or not doing their work, that's another question that you can solve with the school and with the child involved. But um, for the first few months, yeah, really focus on letting them settle in. Um, finally, don't worry if your child gets homesick. It's very normal that a child will call or get upset and call you. And I can promise you that normally something has gone wrong. They've got very upset. They will call in tears. When they've hung up the phone with you, they will disappear and they'll have forgotten about it within a minute or two. And you'll be left on the other side of the world worrying about it. Um, normally, it's a very short period of time. You catch them at a low and um, it's very easily addressed by the school and fixed by the school and by the child themselves. So it's not a huge issue. Um, and I would just say that give your child some space as well to make their friends and don't call them constantly checking up. Figure out a schedule and stick to it um, so you're not in the way of them settling into life and making their new school their home. Uh, here's just some information on BE. We've been around for um, many, 50, uh, about 18 years now, and we offer summer courses, uh, tuition, guardianship, and consulting. Um, and here are some of our placements over the years. We really work with kids to get them into the very top schools around Britain. And um, if you have further information, please feel free to scan to speak to a consultant. And uh, that's the end of my um, sort of speech today. I don't know if people have questions. Yes, Emma, thank you for that. Uh, I believe we do have time for a few questions. Uh, so the first question is, um, how do boarding schools support uh, students that participate in the sport, uh, whether scholarship wise or uh, for students that may already be performing at a high level? How can they continue that training when they're at boarding school? I think that it depends on the sport, obviously. For the common sports at schools, um, the schools, the students would be put in the higher teams, the A teams, and they would have regular practices and they would be regularly trained to participate in that, as well as have fitness sessions. And um, it can get to quite a serious level, particularly in the, um, the key core sports. For others, um, it depends on the school, but um, I mean, we have students at, um, uh, I'm thinking of one at Cheltenham who's a very good ballerina and they actually let her go to a specialist um, to continue her ballet. And a lot of schools will do the same with particular sports that a child comes in with a high level of. Um, so they certainly don't want the child to wither away and forget about that interest. And most schools will find a way of either bringing a professional to the school or letting the child go to a professional center nearby. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, I believe we may have time for one more question. Now, uh, how can I tell whether my child is ready for boarding school? And what years uh, should we start preparing if, my, if I'm interested in having my child uh, go to boarding school in the future? I think you probably will know when your child is ready for boarding school. Again, if you've done the boarding um, school, uh, summer schools, and you've done things where you've put your child in an, in an opportunity to sort of integrate and make friends, if they enjoy it, if they come back positive, 
and you talk to them about it, again, it's, it's all a matter of communication. If they're willing, they're probably ready. You want them to be happy to go and you don't want to be forcing a child out. Um, I think it has to be a family discussion. Um, in terms of when you prepare, it depends on the age group, uh, when they're entering and which schools they're applying for. So some schools need, um, you only need to apply a year in advance. So I would say prepare a year in advance of that. So two years in advance. But as I said, some of the, particularly the top co-eds and the top boys schools, they prepare, they have pretests in year six and seven. And that means that you need to be starting to prepare from the small age, you know, in year five, which is nine and 10. Um, but it does depend very much on schools. Girls' schools are completely different. They have assessment days normally two or one year in advance. So again, preparing a year in advance of an assessment day or a pretest is a, is a good idea. I think that gives enough time, provided you've been doing and laying the foundation work, you know, in reading and writing and things like that um, since they were small. Thank you, Emma, and thank you for your time today. Before I let you go, do you have any uh, last words for our viewers? Uh, no, just enjoy the, uh, the rest of the speeches from these uh, top schools. Um, yeah, they have a lot to share, and I hope it's useful for everyone. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to invite Joe Duncan, who is the head of Wickham Abbey School, to uh, talk with us. Wickham Abbey is Joe Duncan's third headship, and she has previously served as the head teacher at uh, Royal High School Bath and Princess Helena College. She is a graduate of the University of St. Andrew and Homerton College, Cambridge, uh, and Joe is passionate about girls' boarding education and the important role which girls' schools play in enabling young women to reach their full potential. Much of her career has been spent in schools founded by remarkable, forward-thinking women. With a belief that schools are about people, Jo believes that the heart of Wickham, Wickham Abbey's success is its total commitment to pastoral care through boarding and equipping young women with the emotional resilience and integrity required to excel in both academia and the modern world. Jo is joined by Jane Liu, who is a senior and trustee of the Wickham Abbey Hong Kong Foundation, and Sarah Doris, who is the head girl of Wickham Abbey. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I've just started sharing my, my screen, so I hope that you can see the presentation, which is on resilience and academic pursuit. So it's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Resilience has become something of a buzzword in UK schools in recent years as we've increasingly talked about character education and how our schools are very good at developing the whole person and not just enabling our students to get a string of top grades. What we're saying is that resilience is a key aspect of character and this in turn is the basis of not simply success but of a successful life. At Wickham Abbey we have a program uh, which is called Flourishing at Wickham. And that's about seeking to incorporate aspects of positive psychology and research into the lives of our pupils. It's not a standalone part of school life. It's not a separate department, nor is it housed in a suite of offices. Uh, although there are some identifiable component parts. It, it comes through wellbeing lessons, it comes through general studies, it comes through tutoring uh, and various other things. But what we really want to teach our girls is that they're beliefs and attitudes can guide their actions and to help them to understand that when they are aware of that, then they can flourish. I think it's really interesting that we have a program called Flourishing at Wickham at all. And I think it reflects both a greater openness on the part of schools to understanding mental health, as well as the need to address issues both in schools and in society more generally. We are in a situation where our girls have the opportunities that their grandmothers and great-grandmothers could only have dreamt of. And yet, sometimes they need help to understand what success actually is. And in some cases, they need help to enjoy their accomplishments and their achievements. When thinking about resilience, the obvious place to start is with the definition. The word does in many ways bring up images of toughness perhaps, of either being impervious to attacks or having the ability to push on through uh, and tough it out, perhaps some kind of marine mentality. 
But I think resilience is different to that and indeed more than that. And the modern approach is not to try to hide the fact that there will be difficulties, but actually it recognizes that sometimes the wisest approach is for us to bend in the wind rather than try to start stand defiantly in the face of it. According to business, Harvard Business School professor Nancy, uh, Nancy Cohen, her definition of resilience is on the screen. The capacity not only to endure great challenges, but to get stronger in the midst of them. Well, we have all been through a very difficult period. The last few months have certainly tested all of us. And there was an article in this month's UK Tatler about the return to boarding schools. And it started with these words, home learning, virtual Libras programs, international students quarantining at school, and GCSE and A-level exams canceled. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly called for all the grit, resilience, and growth mindset that children, parents, and teachers could muster. Lockdown, which was forced upon us in the UK in March 2020, required us to embrace a whole new way of teaching and learning and working and communicating. At Wickham Abbey, like other schools, we move swiftly from what I would call doubling in technology uh, in the classroom to a full programme of virtual learning. And girls and staff um, and parents indeed adapted admirably to that. However, I think the real test of resilience will come in the coming months now that we have returned to school. What have we learned from this remote learning experience? And how will we use it to become stronger and to become better? How will we cope with the new challenges when we're back in the old setting, but in the new normal? If resilience is the ability to remain positive and future focused, then I think this will need to be a deliberate act on our part. We'll need to consciously work on ensuring that this is our approach. So what's my point? Well, to some extent, resilience, developing resilience is a positive consequence uh, of the successful navigation of a difficult experience. And indeed, it's inevitable that we will all have difficult experiences in life. But more than that, we can teach our pupils that they can choose their response to situations that they find themselves in. And to quote Nancy Cohen again, resilience is like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it becomes. This, I think, is an important message for teenage girls they need to understand it and put it into practice on a regular basis. I think it's important to be clear that a resilient person doesn't have all the answers. It's not about not making mistakes, but about helping girls to understand that they can have the strength to try again, to reflect, to evaluate and to get better. When it comes to girls and particularly to teenage girls, and you will know this if you have a daughter, if you deal with teenage girls, uh, that many of them struggle with perfection. In my experience as a teacher and as a head, perfectionism is often bound up with fear and it can be deeply limiting. We must encourage our girls towards excellence and not towards perfection, to challenge them to be better through learning from their experiences, from the mistakes that they make, and seeing these as far as it's possible as opportunities to grow and to be excited by that prospect rather than scared by it. As parents and educators, we cannot and we should not live our lives through our children. They need to live their own lives and of course they need to be guided by us. And if this is a, a process which is ongoing, then we should be continuing on our journey while they are on theirs. Perspective is another key aspect of developing resilience. Within any school, there will be a range of abilities and talents but it's worth considering the range that that covers. Where it's narrow, as at Wickham Abbey, it can be a really exciting environment and it can allow pupils to achieve incredible things. But this can be a double-edged sword. At Wickham Abbey, pupils have unrivaled opportunities, but that brings with it a pressure, and that is a pressure to succeed and to measure that success simply by one's achievements and to measure these achievements without any sense of perspective of a wider picture. This means that A grids can be discarded as unacceptable because they're not A stars. Or the failure to secure an Oxbridge place, for example, is deemed as catastrophic. 
In reality, neither of these things is true. But without perspective, resilience, that is accepting these things and learning from them, cannot develop. Studies have shown that resilience is a protective factor in insulating people from a variety of mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. And I'm certainly not saying that, it's, that it is as simple as be resilient and never suffer from any form of mental illness, but it can form an important part. The research highlights how people who attained high scores in resiliency tests also demonstrated quicker rates of recovery when it came to um, pulse and blood pressure when they were placed in situations designed towards both of those things. A resilient approach to life links with other useful character traits that we would want to see in our pupils as well as in ourselves. And Matthew Said's book, Black Box Thinking, highlights the importance of being able to analyse what has gone wrong and improve on it next time. And fundamental to this is an ability to accept constructive criticism and objective analysis of what we've done and the outcomes. So is it the case that some people are simply resilient and others are not? Some people are good at facing the difficulties of life and others find it more difficult. Well, no, that's not the case. And studies again have shown that resilience is something that can develop. So if resilience is a good thing, if it can develop, even if it doesn't come naturally to us, then why haven't we all developed to become more resilient? Well, the thing is, it's not that easy on our brains and our thought patterns get in the way. We don't like evidence which contradicts our views. Our brains don't like the tension and find ways around that, and we'll go to some lengths to do so. In a Wickham Abbey context, this is the pupil who is convinced that they're not very good at a subject or that they're going to fail their exams, despite the fact that the evidence is to the contrary, that they're statistically likely to do very well indeed and that they've worked very hard at their studies. A number of researchers have looked into this aspect of resilience and highlighted that when girls are in this kind of position, they can fall into a number of traps. And we see these in our pupils. They do these things, they personalize. When girls are struggling to be resilient and something goes wrong, they can assume that bad things are their fault and somehow it's because of other things that they've done or even who they are as a person. Permanency, with less resilient thinking, they can think that the negative occurrences are permanent rather than transitory. Believing it will spread. When things go wrong, the resilient thinker can put boundaries around the issue and see that that's one issue in their life and that other aspects of their life are okay. But when they lack resilience, they tend to feel that negativity or ill fortune will spread throughout their lives. And catastrophizing, thinking that any negative occurrences will become disastrous and that negative happenings will be taken to extremes. So part of our work of the flourishing program at Wickham is to talk to girls and help them to develop emotional intelligence. We encourage them to look after their physical health through exercise, diet and sleep, and to understand that the more balance we have in our lives, the less susceptible we will be to the malevolent effects of tiredness and of stress. Laughing and finding humour in things has an important impact on our well-being, and resilience and optimistic thinking, which again is something that can develop, opens up whole new avenues of opportunity in our lives. So finally, how can you help your daughter? Well, remember that resilience is not an endowed gift. It can be honed, it can be strengthened, and you can support your daughter as she faces difficult situations. Talk about purpose with her. Help her to understand why she is working so hard to achieve something. Give it meaning to ensure that she doesn't feel like she's on a never ending treadmill, seeking the elusive goal of perfection. Help her to cultivate positive, meaningful relationships with others. And teach her that struggle is not failure, but that through struggle and difficulty, we all grow as people. The title of this session is Resilience and Academic Pursuit. But resilience is a fundamental attribute of success in its very broadest sense. And this in turn will help girls to strive positively for their most ambitious academic goals. Thank you very much for listening to me. I have a couple of other people with me, Jin Lu and Sarah Doris, and I know they're gonna share some of their thoughts on resilience in their own context. So I shall hand over to them now. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Joe. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Jane Liu. Uh, I'm a Wickham Abbey senior and a trustee of the Wickham Abbey Hong Kong Foundation. Echoing what Joe has just said, a large part of being resilient means having the ability to adapt and having a support system around you when you need it. It's doubly important for children going through their formative years today to develop that ability to adapt as things are changing so much more quickly nowadays. The rate of change has just increased exponentially. Major changes used to take place every generation and that became every decade. And nowadays, cycles are only a few years long. Everything is moving that much faster that the ability to be resilient and more importantly, emerge stronger through these major changes, be it geopolitical changes, technological changes, or personal changes. Like, for example, the current COVID situation is an excellent example, um, has really become that much more important for general success and general happiness. Um, looking back at my own experience at Wickham Abbey, the most valuable things that I left Wickham with when I graduated way, way back in the late 1990s, uh, the things that I found actually most useful to me professionally and personally since were not the specific academic knowledge or, or grades, even though I must say achieving academic excellence and learning how to achieve it continues to be very important. Um, rather, the most valuable things that having been somewhere like Wickham Abbey has given me have proven to be Firstly, a set of skills that make up the ability to be resilient, the ability to adapt quickly, the ability to be independent, and the ability to make good choices. And secondly, I think perhaps more importantly, as I mentioned before, was making a group of lifelong friends who have remained a crucial support system for me. That bunch of lifelong friends are and have become even more international in nature with time as people move around the world, people take up capacities professionally and personally, and they're all doing very interesting things with their lives. And, and being Wickham Abbey girls, they're never afraid to tell me when I'm doing something silly. Um, and they never fail to lend a hand when I actually need one. You know, sometimes we think about it, and I'm the mother of two children as well, whether in today's world, boarding schools continue to be relevant with their traditions, you know, with the way they teach, et cetera. And I actually would argue that they're more relevant than ever because they are extremely well-placed in terms of the environment, the rigor, and the way they have evolved. Um, to equip children with the skills that have become ever more important in the world today. We, we're actually seeing quite a lot of that in the workplace recently. Young people who are able to adapt and are more resilient in, in particular in their approach to life are generally progressing more quickly or progressing better and more obviously in their careers than peers who may have on paper have even better qualifications than they do. And, and, and developing that kind of mindset really starts during their formative years. And as Joe was saying, it is work. It takes work to develop that kind of mindset. Um, it's constant work with a big support system around you to enable you to achieve that. So I hope that has been helpful. Um, I would like to pass the time on to Sarah, the head girl of Wickham Abbey. Thank you. One of the many times I've had to be resilient was when I was continuously struggling with English. Being a more scientifically minded person, the subject didn't come quite as naturally. I remember hours of struggling over English prep, what to write in the essay, the correct paragraph format, and so on. I think the first step to change was adapting my mentality, to see English not as a weakness, but as a challenge to be overcome. It can be so easy to get caught in a negative cycle, and stepping out of this and looking on it in a more positive light was definitely key for me. I have friends to thank for this change in perspective. It was actually in a conversation on the walk back up to house, which encouraged me to take a more active approach towards English. And I think that's one of the really special things about Wickham and about boarding schools more generally. 
Living with friends means that you have this valuable support system of people that can really relate to you and advise you in a way which I think is different to that in day schools. Taking control was the next step. I realised that when you put your mind to it, there is so much that you can take control of. I began asking for help when I was uncertain, reading more, discussing with my friends and getting advice from teachers. On that note, I think that a speech about personal development at Wickham would be incomplete without mentioning the quality, commitment and dedication of all the teaching staff here. Recognising how keen a teacher is to support you in a subject they're really passionate about, I think is so important and definitely played a part in my development in English. Wickham Abbey also offers a really wide range of opportunities to discover and pursue your academic interests outside the classroom. From attending medical lectures, talking about sustainability issues, tackling very challenging maths problems, or even discussing classical books, there's something for everyone. To give another example, in year nine, I and six other girls enjoyed spending four months on an engineering project, which involved designing a train station and presenting our project to a panel of engineers outside of school. Although challenging, it was immensely fulfilling. This love of learning is something we all have in common here at Wickham. The three Termini magazines, in which girls are able to write about a topic of their choice, is proof of this desire to think about and share ideas on materials beyond the curriculum. An example outside of academics, where I think resilience is essential, is in the transition to boarding. For many of us joining in junior house, it was the first time we'd spent any significant time away from our parents. For some, it was their first night away from home. And that wasn't easy. It took many chats over a hot chocolate and positive thinking to get anywhere near used to the new routine. There was almost a sense of we're all in this together, with everyone looking out for each other. And looking back on it now, it's amazing how what is initially a really daunting thing becomes almost a part of who you are. Resilience isn't something you regret, and here's certainly a good example. I cannot say how glad I am that I persevered through the initial challenge of being an overseas boarder. To conclude, six years at Wickham Abbey, and in fact 13 years of education, have taught me the importance of bouncing back after a setback. I think part of education is actually learning how to be resilient, something which Wickham encourages and cultivates. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Joe, and thank you, Jane, as well, for your time today. Uh, so we'll begin the Q&A session uh, of your presentation now, um, and I believe the first question is for Joe. Uh, our viewers would like to ask, what is the relationship between Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong and Wickham Abbey School UK? And to follow up on that question, uh, what is the standard procedure for um, a daughter uh, or a child here that's interested in applying for Wickham Abbey UK? How would one do that from Hong Kong? Thank you, Wallace. Yes, so we're very pleased um, with our relationship with our overseas sister schools, as, as we call them, and, and that relationship is, is developing all the time. And I took that post at the beginning of last year, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to develop the relationship both with uh, the Hong Kong school as well as the, the, the schools in mainland China. Uh, and we've been learning actually from our sister schools overseas as we've gone through the pandemic here because uh, they've been ahead of us, I think, in terms of technology. And it's been great to have uh, input and advice and guidance and be able to uh, both learn and, and talk to colleagues um, across in, uh, in other schools. So the relationship is there. The relationship is a strong one and is continuing to develop. But in terms of girls uh, coming from Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong to, um, to, to, to the UK, there is no uh, automatic transfer. So girls or families families who are interested in coming to Wickham Abbey UK would do so through the normal channels of application here and certainly our admissions department will be very happy uh, to talk any family through that. Uh, they register at least a year in advance and then they go through as Emma Van Bergen was discussing briefly, they go through assessment days and, and, and then set, set their papers. So um, I would encourage you if you're interested in coming to Wickham Abbey UK to get in contact with our admissions department. Uh, details are on the screen and we have an open day online next Saturday, which might be helpful for you. And if you wanted to sign up for that, then that would give you a greater insight into the process that uh, families go through in order to come to school here. Uh, thank you, Joe. And then to follow up on that question, what years of entry are offered at 
with a MAVI UK. Okay, so our standard uh, entry is at 11 plus. Uh, we have a smaller number who join us at 13 plus, and then again, a small number who join us at 16 plus. The structure of Wickham is perhaps a little different from some other schools in that um, when girls join us at 11 plus in what we call upper three, they're all together in junior highs. So we have about 80 girls joining at that stage. Um, they then go at the end of that year group into a senior boarding house. Uh, so there are nine senior boarding houses across the site. Those are mixed age uh, boarding houses where girls are with um, girls from uh, other year groups and, and they get to know those girls very well, of course. And then they come back together again uh, in their final year. So in their upper sixth year uh, into a house called Clarence and uh, they're all together again as a year group. And I think, and to pick up on some of the other points that have been said, that very much ties in with the idea of good transition. So transition into school, into, senior, into boarding uh, for many for the first time and really helping them with that transition, then their senior house experience and then at the top end of school transition um, out of school and into higher education. Thank you, Joe. Um, and the next question is, uh, with the situation going on this year, does Wigan Abbey UK plan on having an assessment day in Hong Kong? And how does that process look like for assessment day? Okay, so that is something we've been actively discussing as you, um, as you will be aware of and, and can imagine there have been lots of conversations going on. And um, so we will have assessment days for 11 plus and 13 plus, um, 13 plus in October and 11 plus in November. And uh, we're just making final, final decisions at the minute, but those things are going to be online and full details will be available from our admissions department from next week. And thank you. Um, the next question is, is it possible to attend the school, uh, but not as a boarder? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question, Wallace, can you uh, repeat? Is it possible to attend the school in the UK, not as a boarder, just as daily schooling? Okay, yes, yeah, so um, at Wickham we have a small number of day girls, so we're a school of 650 girls, and we have about 60 day girls. So yes, but those girls live within a 15 mile radius of the school so that it's easy for them to come in and out. They're, there's no separate day girl house. So they are spread across those boarding houses as I described to you. So if they come at 11 plus, they'll go into junior house. And then as they move into their senior house, they'll be a member of one of those other senior boarding houses. Um, but yes, yeah, so we do have a limited number of day places. Thank you, Joe. And for uh, applicants that are interested in applying to the school, um, what kind of public examinations or standardized examinations do they need to go through? Uh, what typically are the credentials that uh, you would look for in a typical student? So again, the admissions department can take you through in great detail, but um, we are looking for girls who are academically able. We're an academic school, of course, but it's much, much more than that. And what we're really looking for are girls who bring a range of different attributes to our school. And I think as a head, what I'm looking for is someone who's going to absolutely enjoy this environment, who wants to board, who wants to be in a, in a girls' school, who wants to give as well as to receive everything that um, she's going to get from Wickham Abbey. And when we go through those assessment days, obviously this year it's going to be different because it's, uh, it's going to be remote, but uh, we'll be applying as many aspects as we normally would to that new situation. Uh, but we're looking at a whole breadth of things. So as well as, you know, written academic tests, girls would be involved in teamwork. They'd be, uh, we'd be looking to see how they engage in science and in sport, how they engage with other people, how they can problem solve and think and be creative. So a whole range of things. And again, I think probably picking up on the comments that Emma Van, Van Bergen made, it's not all about um, academic preparation. That's an important aspect, of course, but it's about bringing your whole self to this, uh, to this process and, uh, and, and engaging with us. Um, what's really important is fit. We want the right girls here at Wickham Abbey, but you want the right school for your child. And it's about marrying those two things together. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, and another question is, uh, what, how can uh, children here prepare uh, for boarding school in general, um, as in, uh, you know, especially transitioning to living on them by themselves and uh, independently um, from Hong Kong? 
Yeah, so I think in terms of a school here and what we do, we are very experienced. There's a, you know, so much experience across, well, all staff, but particularly the pastoral team. So we will be in a position to um, support and guide girls as they come into the school at whatever stage they come in to help them to settle in. There are all kinds of things set up to help them to deal with homesickness where that might be uh, an issue to guide and support them as they make that transition into school. So very experienced staff here who are very well used to that and you know look forward to welcoming those girls and seeing them go on that journey. I think as a parent you can do your bit at, at, uh, at your end at home that's talking very positively uh, around this, this, life, this life move for your daughter, uh, talking to her about what that means, recognising that yes there may well be um, some challenges in that and understanding and a bit like what I was saying in my talk that those challenges are okay and it's about working through them and coming out and being stronger and I just think being open and having a dialogue and for parents again and all, all boarding schools and, and good schools will say this you know that two-way communication between home and school developing the relationship between um, parent and, and house mistress or house masters is really crucial and everybody wants that open dialogue so that we can support the pupils who come to us to settle in, to go through uh, any challenges that they might face and to, to move forward and be really successful in their time at their chosen school. Thank you, Joe. Um, and uh, I believe that's all the time we have for today. Uh, a special thanks to you, Sarah and Jane, for joining us today. Now, before I let you go, do you have any uh, parting words for our guests? Um, all I would say is that uh, as a head, I'm passionate about girls education and about boarding education and of course today's uh, sessions are all about those things and uh, I hope and I'm sure you will get the messages coming through from all of the different speakers that while we absolutely want our pupils to achieve academically uh, a boarding education and the girls uh, boarding school in the UK is about so much more than that and it's about preparing um, your daughters for, for a successful life and, and indeed a life well lived so I hope you enjoy all of the speakers today. Thank you. Thank you once again to our Wickham Abbey team, Joe, Jane and Sarah. We now welcome our next speaker, Eve Jardine Young. Eve became principal of Cheltenham Ladies College in 2011, having been an academic scholar at the school some 20 years earlier. Born and raised in Malawi, Eve has a degree in engineering science from Cambridge and her career in education spans 23 years. Her time at Cheltenham Ladies College has seen curriculum and co-curricular innovation, as well as significant refurbishment and development of the college estate. Welcome, Eve. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just thought I'd start by checking that the sound is working fine. Yes, Brilliant. Thank you. you. Wallace, thank you so much. And thank you very much for that um, introduction too. Gosh, I'm having a wonderful morning listening to um, so many colleagues and uh, obviously always really interested in everyone's questions. So could I start by thanking Howard and all of the team for this magnificent festival. Um, one of the huge benefits of uh, lockdown among the many, many challenges that I think we've all faced has been an opportunity to, to connect with groups of people that we would probably never otherwise have done so and in formats that are completely new. So it's been a, a real pleasure actually for me in the last few months to be able to um, take part in, in events like this and really, really recognise the immense passion that teachers and pastoral teams have for their jobs. Um, let's not take it for granted that by the time you reach your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and later on that you actually enjoy what you're doing. Um, so it's been it's just been a huge pleasure. So thank you for the um, huge amount of planning and arrangements that have made it possible for, for us to um, spend this time today. Um, looking at all the topics, I have chosen this theme, um, which is boarding in the world of COVID. Why bother? And it's quite a, a perhaps a slightly punchy title. Um, I'm aware that uh, listening to the speakers even f uh, from this morning to Emma, to Emma um, and to Joe, most latterly, that many of their thoughts 
and their observations about what makes successful boarding students and what, is, what are the benefits of boarding life in schools like ours um, is really resonant with many of our schools. We would absolutely sort of mentally be giving the thumbs up and lots of nodding. There's such wisdom there and such clarity. So I really uh, would sort of plant my flag alongside theirs for much of what's been said and, and, and give you real assurance, actually, that uh, it makes a lot of sense and, and it's drawn from years of experience. For my short presentation, I would love us to, if we, if we could, for a moment, go up to a, perhaps a higher altitude, um, take the 20,000 foot view rather than maybe the 2,000 foot view or even the 200 foot view of what's going on and, and the decisions that you as parents might be considering in the years to come. Joe mentioned it briefly um, and it, as did the registrar from Wickham Abbey um, allude to the fact that there are traditions there is a long historical taproot that binds what goes on nowadays in our schools to the past. And I think what, is, what it is really important that we do is that we don't sleepwalk into decisions that um, are based on what our experience was as parents when we were at school um, and what we, think, <laughs> what we think our children need. And we really try and take a step back. So this is quite a punchy title and the first slide, thank you very much, uh, Wallace is operating my slides from the Hong Kong end so I'm, I'm going to cue him, thank you Wallace. I, I, I can see a gentleman lying down on the ground looking rather exhausted. <laughs> so I've chosen this picture, it's by a young artist um, who painted this when he was only about 22. And I've chosen this picture because I, I, for me it sort of reflected a state of weariness, a state of exhaustion, which I wonder if some of you are feeling right now. The worries and anxieties of parenting in the 21st century, but also such turbulence in the wider world, whether that be, um, be linked to um, economic uncertainty, linked to just to you know lie flat on his back the upside of this is that he's looking up he's looking at the sky he might even be looking at a at a night sky at the stars reminding us that the stars are always there even when even when the sun's out and it's only when the darkness comes that they can be seen um, and there's an invitation to reflect here on actually what it is you really want for your children by the time they are our age which leads me to a, 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 a reflection or two about what success might be for your family for you as parents what do you really identify as being the hallmarks of success is it a combination of academic credentials is it a material quality of life or affluence is it the ability to make choices and to be at peace with those choices is it to wake up in the morning and know what gets you out of bed? In this gentleman's case, who's lying here in this painting, is it what's going to motivate him to actually, once he's rested a little while, to roll over, to get up and to go and fight another day and, be, and have a sense of purpose and a sense of fulfillment and contentment? So at Cheltenham Ladies College and during my um, 25 years in boarding in three other schools as well as, the current, my, as my current school, I have always, always lived and worked in boarding schools. And I had the opportunity to attend a boarding school um, when I was in my sixth form. So I actually came to Cheltenham Ladies College as a student in 1988, just for two years, just for the sixth form. But it completely changed my life. Would we have the next slide, please? Well, that would be great just to, um, to show everyone what college looks like in an autumn evening, just as the sun's going down and the lights get switched on. So Cheltenham is just one of many boarding schools, and I'm hoping to speak to you this morning, really, on behalf of the sector, boys' schools, girls' schools, co-ed schools, about the whole concept of boarding. 
Cheltenham has been um, in existence for 167 years. It was four fathers, four dads, who in 18, they're crucial that their daughters have the same opportunities to access curriculum and to access a high quality education for the stimulation of the mind and the development of the wider character as their sons were receiving. And it was that commitment to a sense of equal opportunity that really led to our existence in the first place. And that's a very, very powerful theme that I know I'm speaking for fellow heads uh, will be palpable in all of our girls' schools. However, the fact you're on this call at all means you may not, be, may, may not need a lot of convincing about that. But, but I think what I would like to uh, talk about is, is what has enabled schools like this to continue to exist, to continue to be relevant. And indeed, are we relevant? What about boarding in a world of COVID? What would be inducement enough for you as parents to um, not just have your child enrolled in a school that is not necessarily in the same country as you're living, but actually to risk the what undoubtedly people are assessing as the potential perils of the overlay of the pandemic and all of its challenges. So in reflecting on this point, and I do think it's an important point, it's a point that we as schools must not take for granted that families such as yourselves will continue to come in the 2020s, in the 2030s, in the 2040s. But it is really crucial that we look to ourselves and examine what we offer, what is going on here, that actually would be sufficient inducement and actually would be offering you something that wasn't available um, elsewhere. And it may not, it may be that this isn't right for your daughter at 11 or at 13 and it's only in the sixth form, or that it's right for her to come and try and do a couple of years or her GCSE time. Clearly, the best of all is that it works out and she would be happy in a school such as this for many years. But you can always change your mind. And I think you feeling that sense of control and recognizing that there are always decision pathways and that there are always options. Perhaps that decompresses the pressure just a little. So we look, and certainly at Cheltenham speaking for myself, what we have been excited about is thinking about the world that your daughters would be going into because they're hitting the workplace of the 2030s, of the 2040s. They're not hitting the workplace of the 1990s or the 2000s. And we know um, that that workplace will be very different and the way that we all work and economic value is generated will be very different. So might I have the next slide, Wallace? Thank you. So this is another painting. Hopefully uh, you, you, you may or may not be enjoying my presentational style of choice of artwork, but often I think the questions that wonderful, interesting pieces of art present to us are uh, helpful. So this is a painting by a South African artist and it's entitled Corpus, which translates from the Latin into the concept of body. Obviously the physical body, the human being, but actually it has a wider reverberation into the body politic, the body of a collective, the body of a family perhaps, the body of a community, the body of some entity, some set of relationships that identifies itself as connected and as one, as shared in some way. And I love this painting because what you can see is a large figure who is actually slightly bent over and in the embrace of the largest figure you can see two smaller versions of himself or herself who are looking in different directions, kneeling on the ground, feet on the floor, sort of pressing and testing the foundations of something. Between those crouching figures and the overall figure that is embracing them and holding them in their arms, you can see a huge number of feathers. And it's a very personal response, but this reminded me, this painting, of that wonderful quotation from the 18th century, which was, 
there are two things that a parent can give their child. The first is roots and the second is wings. So that sense of who you are, who you belong to, where you've come from. What is the legacy and the precious legacy of your own family's story, your narrative? And equally, don't find yourself tethered to that in a way that completely inhibits your freedom. Make sure that actually you have not only the skills, undoubtedly, we would pride ourselves on being very, very um, good schools with a world-class reputation. But I think for us, that is only the beginning. And around that, there has to come the development over your adolescent years of a gradually more refining sense of self and a sense of clarity emerging over time, not rigidity, not brittleness, but a, a greater sense of definition of what you believe in, what you stand for, what you will fight for, how you will be creative, what observations of the suffering of others motivate you to have a response to that, to try and alleviate, maybe to be an engineer, a systems thinker, to go into politics or writing or thought leadership. There are so many ways each of us can make an impact on the world for the better. So this environment where we grow and we gradually stand up from the child into the adult, we keep our feet on the ground. We are not in the business of arrogance. We are not in the business of thinking at a small scale. We are developing young people who over time, without a pressure cooker and without any sort of top down imposition of a prescriptive pathway, are invited to consider who they might become while they are getting their grades. So right at the top of this painting, corpus, the body, the collective body. This suggests to me then, almost like the pyramids, the brickwork. You've got the foundations and actually you've then got a strong secure, uh, security of the building. And on top of that, you have glass. You have that sense of visibility, transparency, making sure you can see the sky, making sure you can get up and elevate and take the long view. Take the long view as well as being able to attend to what is necessary in the near horizon. So these are skills which are, are difficult to quantify, aren't they? I'm sure you know from people you work with, and I'm sure you know from the people in your lives who have inspired you, that you know it when you see it. You know when you're in a conversation with someone who is comfortable in their own skin, who has a sense of assured, assuredness, and yet who puts you at ease, treats others with dignity, with respect, and allows for a safe and creative space to get the best out of other people. So this larger agenda is also what we are about. We're excited by the multiple cultural diversity that a boarding school brings. We, I know, certainly having visited Hong Kong and uh, travelled in Asia, how incredibly energetic, responsive and inventive so many people are. When you come to a boarding school, which in our case is in the UK, you also have an opportunity for your children to spend time, not just a, a week or a short holiday, or even a summer camp, but actually day in, day out, with the ebbs and flows of daily life, with the difficult days, as well as the days of celebration. To live with people who are not our families and to establish that sense of self-identity. So we've only got a couple more slides. Could we have the next one, Wallace? Thank you. This is a sculpture by, again, um, a fairly young sculpt, uh, a sculptor called Emma Jean Kemp, and it's called When One Is Not Enough. And I'd just like to leave us really, as with the last couple of slides, with an invitation to think again about the long-term view, about the future you would be considering to make your children ready for. It is my belief, and it has been for many, many years through my training as an engineer, that 
the world's interdependencies politically, economically, and absolutely crucially, environmentally. In the decades to come, the decades in which your children will become adults, will become leaders of industry and influential pe people within their families and their neighborhoods and their businesses and their professions. That we will need to work together. Nobody can fix this on their own. Nobody. So learning how to live alongside people who you don't agree with necessarily, how to recognize that people don't come with the same base assumptions. Not everybody believes in the same things. These are important elements. Thank you. Next slide, Wallace, if we may. Kofi Annan in his great wisdom said, to live is to choose, but to choose well, you must know who you are and what you stand for where you want to go and why you want to get there. And I think that last bit is really, really important. Sometimes in the anxiety about performance, exams, empirically measured assessments, those last two segments of back quotation are the bits that sort of get parked. Maybe we think we'll get around to that later. My challenge to all of us is to say these must be alongside us all the way and they must be equal partners in the conversation. Final slide, thank you, Wallace. So a couple of pictures, I've talked a lot and I love to share two images of the girls. This is one in a physics lesson. Those of you who studied this at school then have memories of the Van de Graaff generator where you, um, you're doing electrostatic <laughs> topic and you, you get to put your hands on that metal dome that's on the left and suddenly people's hair sticks out and it's that wonderful moment of this, this picture for me captures the incredible excitement actually and the joy of kids learning things for the first time, of being able to see and understand what makes the world like it is, what are the physical relationships. This is what these girls are looking at if we watch the next slide. They're watching a classmate actually, and that is this fabulous girl here who's got her hands on that Van de Graaff generator. And I think the, the feeling that you can see in those photographs is really what we have here as an essence of a school. We recognize the decisions are difficult. We recognize the decisions you'll be thinking about in the coming years will have changing variables. So having talked about my messages this morning, really through that with the help of some beautiful art, I leave us with a quotation from um, a very charismatic and very innovative American artist called Georgia O'Keeffe. Fantastic, Wallace, we just have a look at this on the last slide there. Thank you. So Georgia O'Keeffe of 100 years old, and she was um, very much a, um, a forward think thinking um, artist. And she said, I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life, and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. And maybe that's, that's an invitation to have courage, because I believe that confidence comes from having courage. You have to take the first step. You have to step out of the cave as human beings. We need to have a little bit of courage. And when we do something brave and independent and something that stretches our envelope out and we don't fail irretrievably and we find we have support if we stumble a little, then, then, and that is how we gain confidence. And I believe when school is over and university is over, that courage and that confidence is what you need for the rest of your life. Thank you, Wallace. That's it for the slides. So I'm really happy to um, switch over now to my hosts for the next bit and take some questions if, uh, if anyone has any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eve, and thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, so we'll begin the Q&A session uh, right now, and I'll begin with the first question. Uh, first question is, uh, how does the application process to your school look for a typical Hong Konger? And uh, some of our guests have mentioned that they see that six form applicants need to sit down for interviews prior to the entrance exam. How is that conducted for Hong Kong applicants? 
Great question. Thank you very much. So the, um, it sounds like the uh, questioner might have had a particular thought um, about um, sixth form entry. So perhaps if I, if I tell you that the entry procedures and processes are as consistent as we can really for everybody, no matter which country they're from. But the, um, the, the, the interview situation for the sixth form entry, um, that now can be done remotely. So harnessing the benefits of technology, such as we're using this morning, um, that the admissions team at my, at my school would definitely be able to uh, talk you through that. But both standard academic entry and scholarship can all be done um, across the miles, shall we say, <laughs> thanks to the very great difficulties imposed on all of us with uh, travel at the current time. Thank you, Eve. And, and just another uh, question on entry. Uh, what are your years of entry point uh, available at your school and what are the sizes of the intakes, especially for year seven or year nine? Perfect. Thank you. So we are, if I give you the context of the school size as a whole, we are a, a school of 840 girls in total. We originally began life as a day school and because of our excellent town centre location um, and the strength of the day market we still have 180 local girls who are day girls actually in college as well so we have about 600 680 boarders right now so for the boarding entry we have entry at 11 plus where we have space for 48 boarders we have a significant entry again at 13 plus where we have round about the same number of borders occasionally if there's the odd bed that comes free for year eight let's call that 12 plus or indeed 14 plus the first year of GCSE we do have occasionally a very small number of beds uh, that come available at that time largely due to the architecture of the houses and how the dorms are laid out so the big entry is 11 plus and 13 plus at around 48 in each, but occasionally there is a space in year eight or year 10. Regarding the sixth form entry, we actually have six form houses, which are um, independent of five year vertical junior houses. And that means we can increase the capacity of the year group yet again. And that's the point that I came in 1988, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, I arrived as a new girl into the sixth form. So you can tell from the fact I'm 48 years old now that this, that we're a school that's been doing this for a very long time. So between 30 and 40 additional beds typically for sixth form entry as well. So the cohort sizes go, including the day girls, from around 60 to 70 in year seven, up to about 120 in year nine, and then up again to about 160 per year group in the sixth form cohorts. Uh, thank you, Eve. Um, and another question about um, applications and entry. Uh, say that my child is interested in applying this year. Uh, how does the assessment day look for this year? And um, what do you expect from the applicants? What kind of attributes are you looking for? How, how should they prepare? Great. So, Wallace, I was fortunate enough to hear um, Joe speaking from Wickham Abbey UK actually about this, this particular theme. Normally, under normal circumstances, we would be welcoming and inviting everybody to the college premises because it gives the girls, you know, a really good opportunity for them to see and feel and meet other girls right here. However, <laughs> For the same reasons, we are pivoting a lot of our um, admissions processes into um, imaginative formats which can be done remotely. So the details of that can be easily found via our admissions inquiries on the website. And just so that I, um, I, I don't make too many generalisations, because we do have a variety of those entry points, the arrangements for each one are slightly different. So could I, if I may, point anyone with that question to the admissions um, team who'd be very happy to answer that for them. The second part of your question was about what qualities and attributes we are, we are looking for. And I think, you know, we, this is an academic school. We offer IB and A-level currently in the sixth form. 
we've offered the IB for 10 years and in 2019 where the world was have the highest average of any of the world's boarding schools on those uh, league tables in terms of average for cohorts larger than 20. Um, so we, but we don't only look at your academic credentials when you apply. We are looking for people with potential. Little girls applying at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 even, they are not the finished article. We don't need them to be perfect. We don't need them to know everything. What we want to know is whether they're teachable, whether they're going to suit and enjoy the style of teaching that we have, which very often is inviting a lot of class discussion, debate, intellectual inquiry, curiosity, that they will enjoy being part of a very vibrant and empowered community of young women, that they will celebrate a, a variety of different nationalities. We currently have girls who live in 47 different countries who board here so we're just sort of making an assessment of really of whether we feel she will be well suited both academically and personally and I would urge all parents really just to let her be herself we've been doing this for decades we can see the potential through the rough ages and we'd love to see that originality and that independence of thought coming through if it's there so lots of reading lots of thinking ideas you know getting her comfortable with actually just talking and expressing herself quite often people young people have amazing ideas locked in their minds and they don't always have the confidence really to to find those words and express so we'd love to draw that out of them as part of our um, admissions process and find out who they are Thank you, Eve. Uh, I do believe that's all the time we have today. Now, before I let you go, do you have any parting words for our guests? Well, my parting words are really those of gratitude because to give up your time on a Saturday when you have so many other things going on in your lives is never something we take for granted. I also think we're, a, we're an organization that we don't ever want to rest on our laurels. We never ever want to rest on historic um, traditions of excellence. We have to develop and nurture within school for staff as well as for girls, a commitment to lifelong education, life beyond school. We're not a factory gate mentality where it's just about getting the grades for the days that you're paying the fees. If you join college, if your family join college, you are going to be part of our lives for a very long time. Uh, if you wish to, and part of a very strong alumni network as well of wonderful women who offer mentoring and advice and work experience opportunities to the girls as well. And they're a great source of inspiration. So really it's, it's not a transactional um, um, engagement really. Uh, and I really hope that if that appeals to you, that uh, you, will, you will explore things um, here a little further. But most of all, thank you for the opportunity and for the very, fantastically smooth organization to the home team. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much, Eve. Uh, next up, we have got Diana and Carrie from um, St. Mary's Con. So Diana studied engineering at Cambridge University before starting a teaching career, which has spanned 25 years, both in HMC and GSA schools. Her first teaching job was at Canford School where she set up and ran a girls sixth form boarding annex and she subsequently taught at Prior Park College and Down House, as well as getting married and having her two daughters before fully immersing herself in boarding once again by becoming a house mistress of a girls boarding house at Bradfield College. She has been senior deputy head at St. Mary's Carn for the past seven years. She is passionate about girls not being limited by stereotypes and helping girls follow their passion. Carrie is a graduate of St. Andrews University and spent the first 10 years of her career working in banking and financial marketing, both in the UK and overseas. She then ran her own business before joining St. Mary's Khan 15 years ago. Her two daughters are both alumni of St. Mary's and so she has first-hand experience of being a parent at the school. Carrie feels passionately that St. Mary's achieves its aim to develop in young women the moral strength to become bold, resourceful, well-balanced individuals who have the capacity to lead and shape our modern world.
Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to try and share my screen now for the, the slideshow. Is that, uh, is that working? Brilliant. Hopefully it is. Um, yes, I'm Diana Harrison. I am the deputy head, a uh, senior deputy head here at St. Mary's Khan. Um, we, I teach physics in the sixth form and I have, as was said, have two daughters at the school. Um, we are at All Girls Boarding School um, in a lovely Wiltshire market town of Khan. And we are about an hour and a half away from Heathrow Airport in the west of England. So over the past few years, we have been thinking, giving a lot of thought as to how we can get best prepare our girls for life beyond school, equipping them with the knowledge and the skills they will need to be successful in the future, alongside ensuring they get the best possible academic results naturally. Therefore, alongside our natural curric traditional curriculum here at St Mary's Khan, we've been working hard to help our girls to learn how, rather than what, to think. The pace of life in the modern world and the amount of information available makes it more important than ever for girls to be able to think and discern what is correct and what isn't. Social media posts vie with more official channels and girls need to be able to navigate through all this and make sensible decisions. Earlier this week, I spoke to the whole school about this and even showed them a post on the internet proving, in inverted commas, the earth was flat and triangular. I showed them it's not enough to take everything at face value. You have to think critically about everything you read, especially on the internet. If one thing the last 12 months have shown us is that the future is unpredictable. And so we need to, need to help our girls learn skills that will last them a lifetime, rather than a list of facts that they can repeat to order. By being able to think deeply about things, they will use their brains more effectively. And as the brain is like any muscle in your body, the more you use it, and the greater the variety of ways that you use it, the more the brain develops. It's clear that encouraging girls to think about things is an important part of an excellent education. Since I left school, at no time in my working life have I had to learn something off my heart and recite it. Instead, I have had to look at information, analyze it, evaluate it, and use it for some other purpose. So this is what we aim to teach the girls to be able to do, to think about the information they are given rather than just accept what they are told. We do not want our girls to be passive learners. Encouraging the girls to question what they're being told does lead to some interesting discussions, but equally it allows the girls to engage fully with what they're being taught on a whole new level. Questions posed by the girls are frequently answered with another question. At no point is information just given and received with no engagement with it. We are not spoon feeding or teaching to the test. We are cultivating curiosity and critical evaluations of facts. As educators, it's incredibly important we pass on a love of learning and this ability to think deeply about things. As a mother of two teenagers, I'm all too aware of how much information is transmitted on social media without the critical awareness that most of it requires. So our connected teaching and learning philosophy brings together all these elements under one idea. We aim to get our girls to be proactive, to show initiative in their learning, to think about what might happen next so they can plan and act accordingly. All our lower four and middle four do a totally student-led individual research project. They have to think about what they want to research and then present their findings. Throughout their time at school, the girls are encouraged to take up opportunities both in and out of the classroom, from setting up societies to competing in national competitions, where girls often win prizes for their entries. But the girls are not only proactive in academic life, 
the girls will also be expected to be involved in planning expeditions for themselves, with some supervision, obviously, either as part of our Challenge and Adventure Walk or for their Duke of Edinburgh Award. Not only do they need to plan the route, but also the menu, and they have to decide on what to eat, as much by what they like as by much how much they want to carry. The support and opportunity we give them to be proactive from an early stage really helps them learn to take intellectual risks and to back up their opinions. We also expect our girls to be curious about the world and to ask questions as much as to answer them. Girls are encouraged to ask why things happen, not just what happens. Science lessons, obviously science is a particular passion of mine, have many investigations and practical work is just part of the natural way of teaching so that girls can find out for themselves about things. And other subjects take this approach as well in the classroom using our research facilities in school. So many people think being creative only applies to the arts subjects. And while that's true at St Mary's, the girls do amazing things in the creative arts. Our art, drama, music are superb. And these subjects do require the girls to think in a different way, engaging with their emotions in a positive way and to put themselves in other shoes. But being creative also applies to other subjects. What could the answer be is a much more open-ended question than what is the answer. For example, we could ask what comes next after one and two. Most people would say three and four. But it could be six and ten if we are only talking about numbers with three letters in the word. Problem solving requires this type of out of the box thinking. So in order to really foster this, we have introduced a computational thinking into our maths curriculum. So the girls are using maths creatively to solve problems. Problem solving is rarely done in isolation. So we also need to get our girls to be collaborative. By working in groups, the girls have to really think about how they're going to respond to the other girls in the group. They need to learn how to respond to each other, incorporating the good ideas into their own thinking and rejecting the bad ideas, but with an explanation of why something else is preferable. Articulating their ideas well requires a higher level of thought processes and collaborative work takes place in most lessons in some form. But again, it also happens outside the classroom and our lower four and middle four take part in challenge and adventure sessions, both in school and in the Cotswold Water Park, during which they have to work together to solve practical problems, such as building the raft you see on the screen. Very rarely is the first solution the best one, which means we also train our girls to be resilient. All our girls need to be resourceful and think of alternatives when setbacks arise, as they frequently do, not only in the teenage years, but in life in general. We challenge our girls to think in and out of lessons, and as a result, they are continually having to reassess and change their opinions based on evidence. In fact, very little goes unchallenged in lessons, and girls are expected to back up their ideas. We also expect them to persevere if at first they do not succeed to try again. An area where this is particularly relevant is sport and all our girls are involved in a sport of one type or another, whether it's a team sport or an individual sport such as riding. And team sports require the girls to think of ways to overcome problems, work out what's the other team doing, learn from their mistakes all before the whistle goes at the end of the match. Back in the classroom, we make sure that there is more time to be reflective. The girls are encouraged to think about what has happened and to learn from experience and their mistakes. Only by reflecting on what has gone on in the past can improvements be made in the future. We are keen to give our girls time to reflect on their learning in every lesson which is why we have three hours teaching time for each GCSE subject a week and six hours teaching time for each A-level subject. This extra time allows greater evaluation to take place. The girls are given time to think about what they've written, to correct, re-evaluate, improve their work. And all this means that the girls 
leave us confident to go out into the world. They can solve the problems they come across, they can analyze the information they're given, and they can evaluate what they know. In other words, we have taught them to think. Our lower sixth form have the opportunity to work with RADA, and we're the only school in the country that does this, on a public speaking course, and their final presentations are really thought provoking. But everything we do is designed to help the girls become confident individuals who are ready for whatever life throws at them. Because we think this ability to think about things in and out of the classroom is so integral to a girl's education, we have specific points in the school year where the teaching of this is front and foremost. In the fourth form, the girls have three weeks off lessons, one each term. These are called Donaldson Weeks after a previous headmistress and enable the girls to do sessions on subjects not normally in the curriculum. They can experience other ways of learning their normal subjects that do not fit into our lessons and they're given the opportunity to visit other places and see their learning in context. Weeks frequently have overarching themes so the girls can make connections between what they are learning in different subjects and even in different areas of school life. Thinking about how different ideas relate to each other is important so the girls can see a topic from all angles. Just recently we had a week based on adapt like a champion as our theme and sessions were held from such diverse members of staff as the head of our tennis academy as well as the classics department. In the sixth form Donaldson week culminates in the Donaldson award Girls need to lead others when they leave us. And to be a good leader, you need all the attributes I have already outlined. And as I have discovered safely reopening the school last week with all the many COVID precautions in place, being a leader requires a lot of thinking on your feet and decision making. Good decisions are only made when analytical and evaluative thinking have already taken place. The leadership opportunities we have in our sixth form here really help the girls put this into practice in the real world. They learn the consequences of their actions and again they evaluate and reflect on how to do something better for the better time. The other strands of the Donaldson Award are all about putting what the girls have learned lower down the school into a more practical context, helping them prepare for life beyond school and university, looking ahead to employment. We are pleased that so many of our girls are keen to experience life in other countries and to learn about other cultures as well as going back to the community. Our Motivate programme is run in the lower stick and includes a bespoke critical and creative thinking programme which looks at current affairs and bias in the media and allows girls to discuss recent events in an informed objective way. The programme also includes another small independent research project where the girls can really delve into something that interests them. But of course, a lot of our girls take the extended project qualification as well. We continually encourage scholarship and a love of learning. Girls are eager to gain the headmistress commendation and join Dr. Kirk for a cake in her study. And we will see girls sitting in the common room discussing their lessons and our new library is now the learning hub of the school. Discussion of academic subjects takes place at all levels and all parts of the school, showing the engagement girls have with their learning. So, how do we know that what we've achieved? We have achieved what we set out to do, namely make our girls thinkers in the modern age. Where we look at how our girls approach various competitions and opportunities, Let's take our debaters. Our debaters are able to hold their own with persuasive, researched, articulate arguments reaching the national final last year. Our young enterprise team wins prizes at county level and beyond showing their entrepreneurial skills. And this is coupled with finding creative solutions to the problems they had along the way. And of course, all this goes alongside excellent academic results and university entrance. Because if we taught our girls to think and respond to problems, they do really well in both of those things. So I hope it shows you that our school is more than just an exam factory, but instead prepares young women to go out 
and make a difference in the world. When our alumni come back, they feel that the St Mary's education has prepared them for studying at university. They are ready to be proactive and show initiative. They are not daunted by the amount of independent work they're expected to do. They're confident in their ability that they can articulately hold their own in seminar discussions. They know how to think both about their chosen subject and about the world around them. We cannot and do not know what our girls will encounter once they leave St Mary's, but we do know that we have equipped them in the best possible way to deal with whatever life holds for them. Our connected teaching and learning philosophy will have helped them develop the ability to learn throughout their life and to think for themselves. So what are we looking for in our Khan girl? Well, our entrance days are designed to look for those attributes that I've been talking about. And they do not centre around an exam hall and lots of tests. We do have a computerised test which each girl will need to take, but it is an aptitude test which requires no previous knowledge. Instead of focusing on testing, we run a critical thinking session where the girls are taught how to solve, approach a problem and to come up with their own individual solution to it. They will be expected to write a short summary of their thoughts at the end of the lesson. We also set the girls practical problems to solve as a group. And we aren't just looking for the girl who solves the problem and is needing from the front. We also want to find the girls who are a team player, supporting the rest of the group, encouraging others, getting on quietly with what needs to be done. The ability to get on in a group is particularly important within the boarding setter. There will also be an interview with a member of senior staff, such as myself, as well as a group interview with the headmistress. So I'm now going to hand over to Mrs. Carrie Deppler, the Director of Admissions, to explain a little bit more about the admissions process. Thank you, Diana. Well, the main points of entry to the school are Year 7, which is 11+, plus, Year 9, 13+, plus, and Year 12, which is 6th form. Admission into other year groups is dependent upon vacancies. So let me talk you through the admissions process step by step. So the first step is to make an inquiry. We'll take your details and create a record on the school database. We'll send you a prospectus and full information about our admissions process. Usually parents make an inquiry three to four years ahead of entry, but this is not always the case. There is then the opportunity for parents and girls to visit the school either at an open day or we can organise individual visits. At our open days, presentations are given by the head girl, headmistress and deputy head. There's a tour of the school led by pupils and then the opportunity to meet with the registrar as well as with heads of department and house mistresses over lunch. Alternatively, arrangements for an individual visit to view the school can be made at a time to suit. Individual visits include a personal meeting with a headmistress or another member of the senior leadership team, as well as a tour of the school. For those who are interested in moving on to the next step, we asked for a UKISET test to be sent to the school. Now, UKISET can be sat in various locations in Hong Kong, including the British Council, as well as various accredited test centres. The UKISET test, together with school reports, enables us to shortlist candidates. Shortlisted candidates are then invited to register their daughter. It's advisable to register in good time as we do close our lists when the number of candidates registering significantly exceeds the number of places available. Registration involves completing and submitting a registration form along with a non-returnable registration fee, which is currently 250 pounds and we ask for a personal statement from fifth and sixth form applicants. We offer taster days normally for 11 plus and 13 plus applicants so that they can experience life as a pupil at St Mary's. If we have space in year eight, which is 12 plus, then applicants for this year group can also attend. Taster days are completely optional and it's not an assessment day, it's an opportunity for girls to have a taste of what it would be like to come to the school. And also, 
you give the girls some experience of lessons, let them get to meet some of the teachers and meet and chat to some of our current pupils, as well as get to know other girls who are likely to make up their year group. Enrolled applicants are then invited to an assessment day, which we call entrance day, which takes place in the autumn term. For 11 plus and for 13, uh, sixth form candidates rather, this is in the autumn term one year prior to entry. But for 13 plus candidates, we assess two years prior to entry. The format of our 11 plus and 13 plus entrance days is the same. And Diana has explained about the critical thinking and the team building activities that we normally run on that day. This year though, due to COVID and travel restrictions, we're having to run a slightly different system using the technology that's available to us. So our entrance days this year have had to go virtual. Now all girls sit the SEM test, which is our online one hour assessment, which assesses verbal reasoning, nonverbal reasoning and numerical ability. And as Diana said, no preparation is necessary for this. Sixth form candidates are normally assessed at St Mary's in November, one year prior to entry. Again, this year, we are going to have to operate a virtual entrance day. All candidates for whom English is not their mother tongue are required to sit an English as a, an additional language paper. And in addition, they sit two other subject papers and have an interview. And following Entrance Day, we offer places to girls who we consider to be capable of benefiting from the education at St Mary's, girls who will fully contribute to the life of the school. Everything we learn about the girls at Entrance Day and from their school reports and references guides our decision. We make A-list and B-list, which are waiting list offers, approximately two weeks after our Entrance Days. For our 11 plus applicants, A-list places are conditional upon satisfactory performance in either common entrance or our own 11 plus entrance exams in January. That's in English and maths. And these exams can be sat in Hong Kong. For those girls who wish to apply for a scholarship, awards are available in the following categories. Academic, music and choral, drama, sport, art and all rounder. Scholarships are not related to significant financial report. Girls who are successful in gaining a scholarship will be offered an enhanced programme of mentoring and enrichment once they join the school. The timing of our scholarship exams are basically November and January. So for 11 plus, the non-academic scholarships are held in November and the academic exams are held in January. For 13 plus, they're both academic and not an academic held in the January. And for sixth form, they are held in the November prior to entry. The admissions team is led by Mrs. Sally Dickens, who's our registrar, and she's supported by Emma Smith and Sarah Pennington. And they will be happy to correspond with you directly about your daughter's application to St. Mary's. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, and uh, we will begin, and thank you, Diana, as well. We will move on to the Q&A session. I believe we have time for a few questions. Uh, so the first question I have is, is uh, as our daughter is so far from home, how strong is the pastoral care at St. Mary's College? Well, I think that's something that is going to be on all your parents' mind, Wallace, because I'm, having travelled to Hong Kong myself with Carrie to talk to parents, I do know exactly how far it is. But I can reassure parents that we only have 360 girls in the school through choice. And that means that every single one of those girls is known to us personally as an individual. And we have fantastic partial support structures in place. So our houses, which are year group based, um, are run by a fantastic team of housemistress, deputy housemistress, day housemistress, and every girl will have her own individual tutor who will meet with her individually in the boarding house, around school, a minimum of once a week, but frequently far more often than that, to check in with her and check that she is doing well in her studies, happy in herself, getting involved in school life. And crucially, that tutor would also be contacting parents frequently about what's going on at school. 
we really see this as a partnership between us here in school and the parents at home. And that line of communication is always open and we're very, very happy to talk to parents at any time. Thank you, Diana. And uh, the next question is, um, so what happens on the weekends? Uh, is your school just full on boarding or do you have daily school op boarding options as well and schooling? Uh, and do they travel on the weekends? So our school is 80% full boarding. So that means that the vast majority of the time we have uh, nearly everybody on site. And even the day girls live so close that they are frequently here at the weekends as well. We have a very vibrant weekend program. Um, we have lessons on Saturday mornings for all our pupils. Uh, we have games Saturday afternoons. And then we have house-based activities um, at the weekends, which at the moment, because of the restrictions, are more often than not on site, but obviously have involved trips to the cinema, ice skating, visits to Bath, under normal circumstances. And in fact, last weekend, we had the whole school out on an inflatable obstacle course with all the COVID precautions in place of bubbles and sanitizing, et cetera. And it was great to see so many girls having fun. So yes, there's plenty going on the weekends. We don't offer any flexi boarding or weekly boarding here. You, all the girls are full boarders. Great, thank you, Diana. Um, and I believe that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you to you and Carrie for sharing your insights, uh, especially about the admissions process as well. So before I let you both go, do you have any uh, parting words for our viewers today? Yes, what I would like to say is that St Mary's is a fantastic community and we would really like to get to know you and your daughter and see if it's somewhere where she could be happy because that's what we want for all our children, that they happy, they're happy and they thrive at school. So do please get in touch with us if you think this might be something you're interested in. Thank you so much, Diana and Carrie. Next we have Bex Tier. Bex joined badminton as headmistress in 2012 and has worked in single sex environments for the last 24 years. She has extensive knowledge in the education of girls and a passion for ensuring they become confident, curious, lifelong learners. She recently graduated, gained a postgraduate diploma in entrepreneurship from Cambridge University's Judge Business School stoking her fire to guarantee that the girls in her care have access to opportunities free from gender bias. Welcome, Bex. Thank you very much, it's great to be here. I'm delighted to join you and to share um, an insight into life at Badminton School and our passion for education. So um, where to begin? Well, I think the thing I'd like to share with you today and my topic today is all about how we embed academic excellence in a slightly different way. Of course, the lessons at Badminton School are absolutely phenomenal. The teachers are absolute passionate subject specialists, but learning doesn't stop in the classroom for us. We believe that learning is a lifelong activity and that's what I want to share with you today. So let me just try and move on my slide. There we go. How we learn at Badminton. So we really believe you have to get under the skin of a subject you really need to understand what it's about. Of course, we know at the end of all of our courses, the girls need to get excellent grades in order to progress to the next level of academic study. However, we believe that's not enough. We want them to really understand the material they're handling, to explore it, to find out if it really engages them and if it's something that they want to pursue in their academic future. We think the way to do that is not by answering more questions, but rather by getting involved. So there's lots of practical engagement at Badminton. And as you can see in the slide there, we've got one of our science students working with a jar of liquid nitrogen. Now, handling that much liquid nitrogen isn't normal in a secondary school. In fact, it's even quite rare at undergraduate level. But we work with the University of Bristol to train our students very highly in scientific practical skills so that they can get this type of experience. Our whole aim is to really broaden their understanding and knowledge and not just fill them up with facts. We want them to really be able to put what they learn into context of the whole world so that they can take it forward and apply it. 
I guess ultimately what we want them to do is to have the skills that they can future proof themselves. We all know how fast the world is changing. I myself have been back to university and studied recently and it was a very different experience from when I was at university as an undergraduate all those years ago. The world is changing, not just in the way we study, but the way we work and the way we live. And people have to adapt all the time. In order to do that, they need to be confident and they need to be curious and they need to be prepared to give things a go. So this practical hands-on approach is really teaching them a way to live their life as well as embedding fantastic understanding so a happy byproduct is excellent exam results. Oh, moving slide. So as we do this, we don't just stay within the walls of the school. We really try and engage with a whole range of people across the world to make sure that the experience is really meaningful and challenging for the girls at school. Sometimes those interactions are real. Of course, recently with COVID, a lot of those interactions have been virtual. But our science research teams, for example, have worked with all of the partners that you see on screen. Why do we do that? Of course, it helps us inspire the girls, but I think there are some key take homes from it. I think if they're interacting with professionals in the field of science across the world, they're beginning to understand the level they have to work at. There is no room for not meeting a deadline. There is no room for not performing at the level required. It's really teaching them to work in a professionalized way and understand what commitments mean in a workplace context. So what else do I think they get from it? Well, for example, at the Big Bang, you see the logo there. We were fortunate enough to be the only school to present at the UK Young Scientists and Engineering Fair called the Big Bang. The audience there was 40,000 and we had girls aged 15 to 18 presenting. Not many students that age present science to an audience that size. That is a fantastic experience for them in terms of communication skills, confidence, and also teaching them to uh, be bold and engage this level of phenomenon. Not all of those girls that presented at that fair are going to go on to be scientists, but that doesn't matter because they can still take away those transferable communication skills. In some of the other situations, for example, the Colours of Ostrava Festival, the girls had to travel to Czechoslovakia and work outside their comfort zone with people from across Europe and Czechoslovakia speaking in many languages to demonstrate the science principles that they were uh, asked to deliver at that festival. So each of these experiences is quite different. Sometimes they're presenting to a massive audience, sometimes to quite a niche audience, sometimes to old people, sometimes to the very young if they're taking their projects into schools. So they also have to learn to be really adaptable, accommodating and understanding of the challenge. Back in school, the girls do undertake detailed science research as well. We're really fortunate in Bristol to have very good universities on our doorstep, the University of Bristol and the University of West of England. We often work closely with them to set the girls' science research project. It is useful that sometimes we link those to something called a Gold Crest Award because that means they can accredit their research and put it on their file and their CV for the future. However, we're aiming higher than that. We want the girls to learn how to write academic reports that will be useful for their next stages for university. We want them to get excited about asking scientific questions. We want them to know how to work as a team. A lot of these projects can't only be taken by just one student. It needs to be a team of students. They've got to rely on each other. They've got to have effective delegation and effective communication. So again, if not all of these students go on to be scientists, that's fine. We're teaching them transferable skills. Beyond that, some of these research projects lead to scientific papers. These are some of the recent things that girls at our school have published. I'm really proud that students leave Babington School, not just with amazing A-level results or GCSE results, but also attributes like being an author of a published scientific paper. That's really showing them that they should be contributing to the world. And that's what we're hoping part of our education at Babington does. 
alongside these fantastic qualifications, alongside all of the other skills, we want them to realise that as educated individuals, they should be making a difference in the world, they should be contributing, and that they should be proud of that. We certainly are. It's not just science. I know I've used a lot of scientific examples in the last few minutes. However, across the school, this is the approach of every department. So I'd like to share a few more examples with you now. Our languages departments are really a good case in point as well. Of course, the girls can speak language in class to each other, be it Spanish, Chinese, um, Russian, Arabic, you name it, they'll give it a go. But it's very different sat in a language class that you've prepared for to in a different context. And so we find as many ways as possible to explore the language. We can't travel to all the different countries all the time. And so what we do is we set up other opportunities. A really good example is how we meet with other local schools and we host debates in different languages. So girls, for example, will meet and talk about an important, perhaps political or educational topic, and they will do so in French or German or Spanish. And that is really good because they have to think on their feet in that language. They can't prepare totally, and they've got to keep explaining and justifying themselves to other people. So they really have to dig deep and find what words they know and how to get around the problem. Something we really enjoyed last year was a fantastic play by the Spanish department. It was one of our A-level set texts and the girls asked if they could perform it as a play. We said yes, thinking, gosh, is that a good idea? It's an awfully big piece of work, but they learnt all the lines in Spanish. Other girls wrote subtitles, which they scrolled across um, on a screen alongside the stage. And so even the girls who were learning Spanish who didn't want to appear on stage could join in and participate in a different way. And it really gave them an empathy for the language and the culture. Now that was at A level, but further down the school, we have a lot of fun with languages too. Recently, we had year seven and eight perform fairy tales in different languages, largely French and German. Now, fairy tales um, are stories which many of us know. We know the background story, so we don't need much translation. We can follow it without subtitles but it gave the girls enormous confidence and I think you can guess from the photo, a great sense of fun to give a go at performing stories they knew in these different languages. We certainly enjoyed watching them. Another area of school life that is really strongly emerging is business and entrepreneurship. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I recently went to the Judge Business School to study for a diploma in entrepreneurship. And I'm glad I did because it is such a fast growing field in education. And I feel that my job as head of the school is to make sure I'm keeping what we offer at Badminton current, relevant and appropriate for the future of the young girls who are studying there. We've seen the entrepreneurship departments of all the UK universities grow enormously in the last three to five years. So we thought, let's bring it into school. Let's help the girls understand this future opportunity. So where we start is in fact, not with our enterprise fund, which is in year seven, but actually in year six, I teach the entrepreneurial mindset skills to girls in our year six. That's the sort of 10 and 11 year olds. I teach them about teamwork, communication, the importance of iterative processes, and these are not just great to build entrepreneurship skills in these young people, but I think they're really valuable for life. We can all see the value of communication and of teamwork, but iteration I think is underrated, but so important. If we teach young people to think like an entrepreneur, when they get a piece of work or one of their projects, entrepreneurial projects back, and they get feedback advice, so this didn't work, that didn't work, you need to improve this, they need to look at it like an entrepreneur. Okay, that's useful information. How do I solve that problem and make a better version next time? If we can get them to have this approach to feedback, then when they get their feedback to their academic work, they can apply the same principles. Okay, so I got a B. What was it that held me back from getting an A? How do I improve upon it? What steps do I need to take to ensure that happens next time? So we think this is great skills for lifelong learning as well as entrepreneurship. So we embed it in year six and then from year seven onwards, 
it really is a practical approach. We have a seed fund, which was donated by local charities, for girls to apply and pitch their businesses so that they can gain seed funding to set it up and run it. They have to then generate enough income to pay back the seed funding so that it's there for the next year's students. We think this is a great way of running an entrepreneurial activity because they have to make a viable pitch in order to get money. They can't just say, I think I want to do this. They've got to show us how they're going to spend the money, how it will enable their business, and then how the business will become self-sustaining and pay back the seed funding. Working with real money, real projects, real sales, being accountable in that way for 11, 12 and 13 year olds, we think is really, really exciting and important. If there are challenges in the team, if there are some friendship fallings out, they can't walk away from it because they've got a contract having taken that money. So they have to work through those things, which is a really important life skill. They find this experience hugely fun at first, sometimes frustrating as they find the challenge of actually taking a product to market bites in. And at the end, when they work through all those problems, they find it really, really rewarding. So we think this is a great scheme that we've developed. Moving on from that, girls at school take part in national competitions. The Peter Jones Foundation is a huge entrepreneurial foundation in the UK. Peter Jones uh, is, is very well known in the UK for running a, a program called Dragon's Den, where entrepreneurs pitch and it's shown on television. Our girls entered his Tycoon Enterprise Competition last year, along with hundreds of thousands of schools and their different teams across the UK. And I'm so proud to say that Badminton's team won nationally. They were the overall winners of the whole competition. And our team called the Citrus Way, who um, made all sorts of citrus-based cleaning products, they are now taking their business forward. So it was more than just a win in a national competition for them. They are now scaling up their business, which is something that I think is hugely exciting for 16 year olds to be doing. So why are we so passionate about all of this work outside the classroom? Well, I hope I've begun to convince you that the importance of doing this work is to bring wider skills that pupils today will need in their uncertain future. The world is changing. These young people will have to adapt throughout their career. They may even have to totally adapt and change their career into a new professional sphere. So we need to make sure that they are resilient, communicative, able to adapt in a team, willing to think and problem solve, and to keep going no matter what. We think all of these projects help them do that. We also really believe that by exploring science, humanities, arts and languages in all these practical ways, the girls understand the subjects so much more deeply and effectively than if they were just sitting in a classroom, ticking the boxes to jump through the exam board hoops. This enables them to make much better choices about their next steps to university and beyond. And by doing that, we see that badminton girls go on to succeed in their degrees. They don't drop out, they don't change subject, they absolutely thrive and fly at university. And that's what we want. The badminton experience is an experience for life. It's not just for the days they're with us. And we really believe that our approach is enabling that. I hope I've excited you with some of the things going on at badminton. I certainly love being here because there are so many innovations, challenges and new ideas that help me make Babington an exciting place. So I hope you want to find out more. And if you do, I think there's a chance for questions and answers now. So over to you, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing that uh, with us. So we'll begin the Q&A session of uh, our presentation. Uh, now start off with the first question is, how does the uh, mission and entry process typically look for uh, an applicant from Hong Kong? That's a really great question. So an applicant from Hong Kong, normally I would hope to meet you by coming to Hong Kong, although this year, obviously we're working a lot more virtually. So the process will involve um, engagement with the school. We need you to find out about the school and then register. Once you've got to a point where you're pretty certain badminton's one of your handful of schools and you've registered, 
our admissions team will be in touch with you, making sure you've got all the information you need. And from there, they'll advise you about how to go through the assessment process. The assessment process from Hong Kong can involve a UCASET, a detailed reference from your current school, and an interview of about 20 minutes with myself or one of my senior colleagues at badminton. And for us, it's that interview that's really important. The senior school at badminton is about 360 pupils. And so we really need people who are keen to join our environment because every individual makes a difference. So us talking to you is what really informs the choice about the next steps. And thank you, Bex. And uh, just to follow up on that, what are the available points of entry um, at badminton? Good question. So our usual entry points are year seven. Um, we do have some year five boarders join us, but that's usually quite a small entry point. Year seven is a main entry point, year nine, and then sixth form. Sixth form is our most competitive entry point with um, usually um, several hundred applicants for about 10 to 15 spaces. So that one's quite a tough one. And that's based on um, competitive entry where we'll ask you to sit papers in your A-level choices alongside the interviews as well. Uh, thank you, Bex. And the next question is uh, just a bit more about um, campus life. So uh, could you share more on how uh, typical campus life is for the girls at your school? Yeah, absolutely. We're really lucky at Badminton. We have got a lovely leafy green campus and it's all enclosed. Everything's on one site, which makes us have a little world here that we can live in. So um, for the girls, if you're a boarder, your boarding house is uh, in one of those areas on campus. We have three main boarding houses, a junior one for years five to eight, a middle years one for years nine, 10, 11, and then a sixth form space, which is a kind of a pre-university experience. So you'll be in your boarding house. Um, and the thing about our boarding houses on weekdays, when you get up and go to breakfast, um, you take your school bag with you and then you're out for the day. The boarding house shuts in the daytime so that together with our day girls, you have to have organized yourself and be responsible. We think that's really important because we want girls to learn to prepare themselves for a working day, just as if they were going out to university or going out to the office. Um, and so that really helps with that preparation. On campus, of course, in the morning, they meet their tutor first thing, um, who sets them up for their head, make sure they know what they're doing, checks in with them. Then we have assemblies, either whole school or year group. Then we go through the day of lessons and sports and activities. And our dining hall is central on campus. All the girls eat in the main dining room. And that's a key feature of the day for snacks at break, a fantastically versatile lunch, tea time snacks to keep them going before a hearty supper. Throughout the day, there's opportunities for clubs and activities, be it at lunchtime or tea time or after school. And the girls really see the ca whole campus as their own home. That's what's fantastic about our boarders. So if they want to be doing artwork in the evening, the art block is open for them. If they want to go to the music block to practice their instruments, the music block is open for them. It's all supervised, it's all safe, it's all on campus. And they really make the most of all the facilities. I hope that answers your question. It's quite a broad one. So I tried to give quite a broad overview there, but if there's anything more specific, do ask. Great. I uh, know. I think that was, that was great. Um, so uh, the next question is in terms of borders, how many borders are at Badminton and what is your diversity? How many are international students? Where are they from? Yeah. So um, in terms of boarding at the moment, we've got about 190 borders at Badminton. Those are the full borders. On top of that, we have some weekly and flexi borders who are very locally based and um, that tends to be that they're weekly or flexi because of their other commitments. In terms of the spread of our student body, um, we have um, obviously a large number of quite local students. And then on top of that, we have, I think it's 27 different countries represented at the moment. Um, and Hong Kong is quite, I would say, a, a leader in our overseas borders, um, but also, um, Thailand, China, Russia, Spain, um, Germany uh, are also quite up there as well. Great, thanks Bex. Uh, and uh, the next question is, it is coming from more of our international uh, students. Is it, uh, do you have a recommended year of entry in terms of com competitiveness for uh, international students? Should they be coming in? Is it easier at 11 plus or 13 plus, et cetera? I would say 13 plus, 11 plus, 
are definitely using them in sixth form. Um, um, and you know, that's just a fact of life because I think more people are ready to leave at sixth form and want that pre-university experience of boarding. Um, but what I would say is we really encourage parents to know what's right for you and for your daughter. For us, there is no one right point. We will occasionally take a year 10 girl, we'll occasionally take a year eight girl, just because the family circumstances suit that family, that girl at that time, and we have a space available. So we really want families to talk to us about what's right for them. Now, sometimes it happens, people come and have an 11 plus assessment, and we meet a fantastic family, a fantastic girl, who are so right for badminton. They get the spirit of the school, they will fit in academically, and we say, yeah, we'd love to have you. But they're wobbling about it, oh, we're not sure. We say, look, we're gonna make the offer, and you just let us know if you're gonna come at 11 plus or 13 plus. So all the time, once we know you, once you're in our registration process, we'll work with you to what, what's best for you. We don't want anyone to come just because that's, that's the easiest way to get in. We want you to come when it's right for you. Thank you. Uh, and in terms of graduates, uh, what universities do badminton school graduates typically attend? Good question. So um, obviously every year there are applications to Oxford and Cambridge and we see a, a steady trickle there every year. Medical schools is probably our most uh, common type of, of organization the london ones being very popular with the girls um, in particular i think after that edinburgh and um, st andrews are popular um exeter is very popular and strangely enough bristol is also quite a popular university for us durham a little bit but not quite so much and then after that it's just a big range according on the students interests we do have a regular number of girls applying every year to music conservatoires and art schools and art foundation courses. And we're, we're really happy to prepare for that. Also every year we have girls go to the US, um, Tufts, uh, MIT have been popular in recent years. And we can go through the American application process too. We've even overseen applications recently to Canada, Hong Kong um, and Europe. So our, our sort of approach to our education is we find what's right for the individual and that's our aim is to achieve that for them. Thank you, Bex. And uh, I believe we have time for one more question. Uh, next question is, um, why badminton? What's different from badminton in terms of uh, what they offer for girls boarding education compared to maybe some of the other schools? I think what's different about us is really what I spoke about, that we have this hugely practical approach to education. I know everyone says our education is holistic. It's one of the things you see on every website. But I truly believe we are quite unique in the level we take that to. The fact that we're partnering with international organisations like CERN, the Institute of Physics, um, and we, we have these opportunities whereby girls are winning national entrepreneurship competitions the girls here are so practically engaged with their subjects. And I think they can do that because badminton is a very small community. We're by choice a small school. And that means that we know the girls, they know us. It's a very comfortable environment. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean it's easy here. What I mean is everybody knows each other and is very, very confident. And I think when you're that confident in the environment you live in, you can take risks because you know the people aren't gonna laugh at you or judge you they'll just say, go on, give it a go. And in order to learn, you have to push the boundary of your understanding. You have to go outside your comfort zone. Learning is a risky business. And if you're in a fantastic sport supportive environment, you can really push that boundary confidently. So I think that coupled with the opportunities we give for really practical engagement makes quite a special place to be. Thank you, Bex. And uh, thank you for joining us today and, and sharing all your insights with us. Uh, now, before I let you go, do you have any parting words for our guests? What I would say is England, UK and across the world, there are many great schools. I think you're, you're uh, probably at a great school now. So ask your head, ask your teachers what they think is right for your child. Put that together with your fantastic in-depth knowledge of your own child. Do your research and have an exciting future educational pathway. Bex, thank you very much for that. Wonderful to hear you. Very exciting to hear about badminton and especially the practical learning projects um, and how they embed 
academic excellence. We're really grateful for your time. Um, indeed, for all the schools, because we know that this is the weekend that all the girls are either coming back or have just got back. And probably outside your study there, there's probably piles of suitcases and a lot of movement going on. Uh, so we're very grateful for, for your interaction. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you also to all the other speakers, uh, Downhouse, Wickham Abbey, Emma Van Bergen from BE Education, Cheltenham Ladies College, St Mary's Khan, and again, Badminton, who we've just heard from. Uh, my thanks to all uh, people who've been with us all through the afternoon. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Uh, thank you to Wallace, Ben Mitchell, uh, and Emily Harrison on my team. And uh, before you uh, hit that red button, do remember to register with us uh, for next week, where we'll be hosting the boys' schools. And you can find out all about that uh, in our marketing material, uh, all by getting in touch with us. Thank you very much, and good evening. Thank <laughs> you.